Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm happy to introduce our data science seminar about technology behind the AI. Raise hands who think it's a revolution. And now raise hands who think it's an evolution. <laughs> so uh, I hope that we will, give, uh, we will get some sort of answer to this kind of question as well. Um, and we, ha we are so happy to have this uh, seminar joint with the NVIDIA. I will introduce uh, them in a second. Um, but before, before we go there, I want to say that over the last six and a half years, we have been running data science seminar for 28 times already, and this is the 29th event. We also managed to do it through the COVID lock lockdown periods, then we were uh, online only, but uh, the idea is that we get people together in one room and allow for networking in here. Uh, I know by the registration, there were over 270 people registered. Some forgot about the event, did not show up, I think, but half of the people are from the industry. So on the technical roles, engineers, uh, some C, uh, executive roles, and the other half is from, from academia, which is a perfect uh, mix uh, with the faculty members, PhD students, master students, um, etc. So we are all uh, set for this uh, event. Um, my name is Jaak Villa. I'm heading the data science uh, chair in here. And over the last 12 years, I was heading the Institute of Computer Science. Um, before we go there, I want to remind that who, ha who has interest towards AI data science, we have such curricula at the master level where you can study in English or in Estonian, uh, computer science, uh, data science curricula. Uh, this uh, Anmeteatus Estonian uh, curriculum with over half of the courses in English, uh, the application period is ongoing at the moment until um, Midsummer. Uh, we are also doing a lot of research in AI, and IT Academy has been funding some of the research topics uh, about AI. We will host in May the two day conference uh, with those uh, principal investigators, PIs, who are uh, studying AI in here as well. So the IT Academy funded uh, people. So that's a public event where there will be few presentations, but poster uh, sessions and networking available. And last but not least, we also run summer schools. Uh, at the end of August, we will have summer school in computer science and computer and system sciences. Uh, that's also the first announcement now, but we have the lecturers set up for this three-day event seminar in here. Everybody welcome to join. So, NVIDIA, I was a little bit surprised to, <laughs> to look at their incredible market cap. Uh, on the graph you see that the top there is NVIDIA and the two bottom ones are Intel and AMD. So NVIDIA is surpassing compute power generation for the world and uh, at the moment they are uh, seventh um, highest market cap in in the US market. So uh, basically you know that they are producing majority of the hardware for all the AI uh, needs of the world and happy to have the speakers where today in two sessions we will go through six lectures. Uh, we will start soon with the NVIDIA overview uh, large language, mo uh, language models introduced by Kairi Zirts from here, and uh, Zenotia Charpy, Senior uh, Deep Learning Data Scientist from NVIDIA after that. So the first session is more about language models, and the second session is more about autonomous driving. So NVIDIA, uh, Fabian, okay, somebody has to turn off the microphone on the online. Uh, Fabian Weiss, um, then we have one presentation from University of Iowa, uh, Omar Ahmad, and last, 
uh, our own Tambet Matisse and from, from this building. So we'll, we will have six presentations, uh, about 25 minutes per presentation and questions. So the presenters will have about 15 to 20 minutes, followed by some quick, quick questions. And the, I am consuming that time at the moment. So I would like to, uh, without any further ado, start handing over to our lecturers. Uh, for, for some reasons, there are still some travel bans for NVIDIA. NVIDIA uh, people may be able to tell about those reasons if they want, but we will have uh, all of them presenting online to us in here. So sorry for that, but this was the second best option. So we did not want to leave uh, but to, to stop this uh, data science seminar uh, because of this tiny little detail about some travel restrictions. Um, so, we're, we're, this is your introductory. Okay, this is your slide. Um, I wanted to check the name. So, Lyon, um, Lyron Friends Sadon, Director of Developer Relations, NVIDIA, would be the first. Happy to hand over to Lyron. I hope that you have heard me and you can, I've heard. And you can start, please. <laughs> so first of all, thank you very, very much for this invitation and it's really great to be here. Um, I really liked your opening question. Are we in a revolution? Are we evolution? Um, but I think there's one very plain thing to see and that's, you know, Every industry that we see today is uh, undergoing many, many changes, and this is due to AI. So there's many new use cases that we're seeing coming up in every industry today. Um, I think this is something that's been ongoing the past few years. And then the past few months with generative AI and LLMs, which we'll be talking about later, um, I think this is even a, a, a bigger revolution, evolution, I don't know, but a bigger transition and a bigger place for more and more use cases that are coming in. Um, so what does this have to do with NVIDIA? So like you said, NVIDIA is actually, um, let's say the engine behind everything that's going on with A models. Um, that's what most of the people know us about, but I do wanna take a little bit of time um, to make sure that you guys learn and understand today that on top of all the hardware that we're doing, there's a lot of software and work being done um, in order to help accelerate all these models that are coming in um, in AI. And it doesn't matter if you're doing computer vision, it doesn't matter if you're doing NLP or large language models, um, it doesn't matter if you're accelerating workflows. In, in any one of these use cases, and again, in any one of these verticals that you're working in, you need hardware and software to work together to make sure that everything runs smoothly. So um, I'd like to start with, you know, kind of like a brief overview of what our computing platform looks like. So everybody, I think everybody uh, knows our GPUs and this is the hardware that you can both train your AI models and then you inference or you put your AI models in production. Um, well, what you should know that is that NVIDIA is also working on two other chips, a CPU and a GPU. A CPU is not your regular, uh, let's say, personal computer CPU, but rather a CPU that will be placed in very, very large um, clusters so that you will have the best possible way to train your models and that the relationship between the GPU and the CPU will become better which again will allow large language models and other very, very, very big models, generative AI models to train better, to run faster, to run smoother. And the last part is the DPU, the data processing unit, which again is a networking smart card so that when you have a lot of servers connected together and you're training all these large models, these three chips will make sure that even if the models are getting bigger, and larger and have more parameters and you want to do tuning, everything will work a lot more smoother so that the, the networking and the relationships between all these three chips will be great. On top of these chips, again, you know, we sit in data centers, we sit um, in edge computers, you can put the GPUs wherever you want. 
And the second part, what you see on top is the important part. So what we do is um, we have a lot of acceleration libraries so that it doesn't matter if you are working for the little bit more technical guys um, with PyTorch or TensorFlow or any other frameworks or you're processing video streams or you are putting um, production models into production environments, we have acceleration libraries that help do this quicker. So think about you know um, places where they have a lot of camera streams and you need to take all the video streams and you need to apply AI in all these video streams and you want it to be as close to real time as possible, we have an acceleration library called DeepStream that can do that. Or if you're just you know, fine tuning your deep learning, your deep neural networks, we have an acceleration library called CUDNN that helps accelerate everything that has to do with deep neural networks. So what we do with the ecosystem, or at least my position, is to work with developers that, and understand their use case um, and then start fine tuning and finding the right software that NVIDIA has to take their acceleration one step forward so that training becomes faster or that inferencing or production becomes faster. Um, and the top layer, what you see is um, the fact that we understand today that putting AI in different industries is a little bit different. So if you're doing, let's say, healthcare and medical imaging, the way that you're going to put your production models into, uh, into the production environment is a little bit different than if you're doing self-driving cars and automotive, which you'll hear about later today. So what NVIDIA realized is that when working with these different industries, you need a little bit of tweaking and a little bit of different um, ways to put these production models into the production environment. And so what we have is industry related frameworks and what we call AI application frameworks to help get that done. Um, one thing about the GPUs, you know, we started off as a graphics chip company and the GPU was actually a graphic processing unit. And over time, once we understood that this GPU was good for AI, we also understood that, you know, AI doesn't come in one shape or size. And so we need to make different GPUs for different use cases. And today um, you're, you're able to run our GPUs on the public cloud, um, on an edge device. We have small GPUs that can go on cameras, um, that can go in sensors. Um, obviously we go into data centers and of course PCs, and we comply with all the regular frameworks and, and libraries that you probably know today with it, Python, um, C++, PyTorch, TensorFlow. So it's very, very easy to take hold of these GPUs and, and kind of run with them. This is just an example of the different GPUs that we have. And again, um, part of the things that we do is basically sit with you guys and understand what the use case is and what would probably the, be the best GPU would be for the use case. And um, for all our software, and this is very important, um, and one of the takeaways that I like to leave you with today is um, we have something called the NGC catalog, which is basically the place where you can find all our software. So our software consists of SDKs, and I will say almost all of our software is free, free open source. This is something that we really believe that in order for the ecosystem to go ahead and develop and, and run forward, um, we need to open source our software and we need to you know let the ecosystem use, make it better, um, and accelerate their own development. So what we have are SDKs, like, like, a, like an accelerated version of PyTorch or TensorFlow, which you can download. We, um, we support all the versions. So for sure, the version that you're using to train your models, we have accelerated. And by the way, this is like my first uh, recommendation to any uh, startup or company that, we, that I work with. Um, always take your frameworks from the NGC because they will for sure be the most optimized over our GPUs. Uh, we also have SDKs to make inferencing um, faster, to make training faster. So again, you can take a look around <clears throat> in our catalog and check that out. Models. So we have a lot of AI models, which we train on public data. Um, and that gives the ability to take the models and retrain them or even use them as is. We have computer vision models, we have NLP models, we have speech models. And this is a really good 
starting point for a lot of companies that are starting to put AI use cases um, into their workflows or into their um, applications. And of course, we've got scripts. And these scripts will help you optimize your training and your inferencing. So you can take the scripts as is. There's a little tweaking that you need to do. But um, the script is there so that when you run either training for your AI models or inferencing in production, you'll be able to optimize over the GPUs. Um, <clears throat> so like I said, we have a bunch of models. Um, we have um, models that you can take as is, like heart rate estimation is not usually something that you retrain, um, but obviously language translation or vehicle make identification. We have many, many, many models with many, many use cases. And, and this is why I, you know, I suggest to go into the NGC to look at all our model zoo. Um, there's definitely something for your use cases that you need. Um, and again, the retraining and customizing of AI models is not a simple task. Um, I can tell you I've been at NVIDIA six years. I think in the beginning, there was a lot more computer vision models. Um, now we see speech and NLP and all these different models coming into play. And, and there's so much data out there and you need to label the data and you need to take care of the data and then you need to retrain the model and then you need to optimize the model. So all these things, again, NVIDIA has been doing on our own for so many years as an AI company that what we decided to do is we decided to create tools that will help um, data science workflows work better. So for example, for retraining um, AI models, we have something called Tau, which is short for train, adopt, and optimize. Um, you can take Tau, you can take an AI model of whatever um, area, uh, vision, NLP, which you'll hear about our LLMs um, a little bit later today, and you can just retrain them. And, and this um, app SDK is going to help you do that in a very optimized and in a very um, efficient way. So it also knows how to take care of the data, whether it's real data that you're labeling or doing synthetic data. It doesn't matter which uh, retraining models you have, it'll do it the most optimized over the GPUs, and then it will get the models ready to be optimized in any deployment that you're doing. Um, the other thing I do want to say is that, you know, when you train your models, it takes a while to, to optimize and fine tune them. And again, it doesn't matter which models you're working on. And then you have another challenge, which is getting it into production. That's not a simple thing to do either. Um, you have to know your production environments very, very well. You have to make sure your uh, models are optimized to that production environment. Think production environments like like healthcare, uh, you'd be in a hospital or in a self-driving car and the car is gonna be autonomously driving. So think about the different production types and what you need to do for your models to optimize them. Um, for that too, NVIDIA has many different tools and, um, and ways to optimize uh, your models. And the last one I wanted to make sure you understand is that it's not only a model, and the production environment. There's a whole workflow to it. And by the way, these are things that we've discovered and we've developed and we've supported over the years once we, once we worked with more and more companies that were putting AI into productions. And what we realized there's also workflows, like for example, if you're working on a recommendation system or even customer service, um, there's a workflow that you need to um, maintain like for example, if someone's speaking, you need to take their voice and you need to stream it back into the application. And then you need to um, encode that voice and you need to define that voice and understand what language and what they're saying. And then you need to reply to that voice. That's a workflow. And so we have a lot of workflow engines, um, whether you're doing cybersecurity or autonomous uh, vehicles, which you'll hear about later. And you'll understand that it's not only a model it's not only a model and, and a production environment. It's also an entire workflow that you need to put in when, when putting in um, AI use cases. So that was like a brief introduction to what NVIDIA is doing these days and, um, and how we're helping to spark either the revolution or evolution, whichever way you want to look at it, um, but definitely a, a, a transition of many, many industries into the world of AI. I do want to tell you um, just a few programs that we have. So um, for you out there that are from industry, 
If, uh, if you guys are a startup, we have a great program for startups called NVIDIA Inception. Um, what we do is we give a little bit of closer support in order to get um, um, either training or inferencing optimized. Uh, we have go-to-market support, technology assistance, and of course, um, solution architects from NVIDIA that help you guys um, uh, progress faster. Um, so if you're interested, you can go, you can look up uh, NVIDIA Inception and you can get all the information from there. Um, we do have something called Launchpad, and this is for all you data scientists out there. Launchpad is a great program where you can actually like test drive whatever SDK um, you want to try. So if you look up NVIDIA Launchpad, you can see all the different launch pads that we have. We have some that are GPU related. So if you want to try out like the new H100, which is our new GPU, or if you want to try out a certain SDK, um, whether it's Tau that we just talked about, the train adopt uh, optimize, or one of our large language models that you'll be hearing about later. So we have a bunch of uh, launch pad environments that you can try out. And usually you get the environment for around two to three weeks and you can play around with it and get familiar with that certain SDK or hardware. Um, we spoke about we spoke about NGC. So NGC is a central hub for all our software. Um, really recommend to go in there and start looking around. We do have something called the NVIDIA Deep Learning Institute, and I will say one one word we about academia. So if you guys are from academia, we have something called the Ambassador Program, where we recommend um, people from the university to get certified on the courses, and then. Some of these courses they can um, they can actually give at the university. Courses are usually eight hours long. Um, they they have like hands on, so you can um, run a deep learning um, workshops, whether it's an NLP or speech or even just fundamentals. Um, but this is a great way to uh, to get started. So if you look up uh, Nvidia Deep Learning Institute, you'll see all the courses available. And last but not least, um, we have our developer zone. This is where you sign up to stay up to date with everything going on at NVIDIA. Um, once you sign up, it asks you, you know, what your interests are, or is it NLP, is it generative AI, is it healthcare, is it academia and research? Um, and you sign up to everything that's related to you and, and your interests. And this is how you get all the news for what's going on at NVIDIA, new GPUs coming out, new software coming out, um, anything and everything going on in NVIDIA, webinars, how-to sessions. Um, so really recommend to, to join the developer zone as um, And that's it for today. Thank you very much. Okay. There's a bit of applause in here. I, I hope you heard about that. Um, do we have questions? I can fill in with some questions. I have a uh, nasty question. I have, uh, how do you operate in the regulated markets in the field of uh, healthcare or somewhere where uh, your customers need to get these certifications, C markings, all of, all of that? Do you have some sort of support for these kinds of activities? So that, that's a great question. Um, well, first of all, since we do operate globally, everyone has their own uh, set of rules. So in Europe, we have CE mark. Uh, in America, you have the FDA. Um, basically, we support in the back. So whatever the needs are of those companies, and, and by the way, we work with, you know, all the big medical companies, obviously, everyone's doing medical imaging, but not only, right, we have genomics, we have, there's a lot of use cases going on. Um, we support in the background, we have a lot of startups that are already have FDA and CE marks approved. We already see AI productions um, in many hospitals. So, you know, the companies are in the front. They're the ones that are working with uh, FDA and CEs, but if they need anything from us, obviously, you know, we're here to support. Yeah, okay, thank you. Have you ever met Estonians? They are very slow to start their parties, right? <laughs> <laughs> they, they don't dare to ask anything until over the glass of wine. Um, okay, we have one German guy in here. Who asks always questions, but okay. Uh, uh, I thought this uh, mentioning of the learning center was very interesting, and as we are a university um, and uh, always need resources to learn uh, to, to learn more and to get uh, people involved, uh, that is an yeah a, a huge uh, boon for us. So. Um, 
what is the experience in actually using the existing classes in universities? So is there any problems with regulations uh, that this cannot be accepted, uh, it has to be redone by us, or is there some direct support for teachers to embed the existing solutions in, in the existing classes? Okay, so that's a great question. So we have two things for universities. We have something called teaching kits, which um, I will share. The teaching kits are more for um, uh, professors and researchers that are giving AI classes, and there's a lot of um, teaching material there. So in the so by the way, we approve. You know, we we see who's requesting the teaching kit, and we approve only those who are um, affiliated with the university email. And you first of all, those are you can use freely and however you want. There's homework assignments, there are slides, there is teaching material, there's everything there. And in many, many different subjects, robotics, CUDA, uh, deep learning, uh, graphics. So I, I highly recommend that first you take a look on that. Then there's the courses themselves. The courses are usually, um, what we see happening at universities is they'll do like a one day seminar. So it's not necessarily part of the curriculum itself, but more, of um, of something that's being of like an add-on um, or like because the, because it's hands-on and we have like like you really do train um, models and you run on GPUs the courses are very built so you know you can't like really change them but when you see the flow you'll understand that there's a flow to it and then usually what we see at universities or ambassadors are doing these courses as like a one-day seminar or you know some like a like a add-on on top of the curriculum. Yep. I have another question. I have another question sure. about your uh, device architectures and how they co-evolve with the model architectures. Like these days we see that a lot of these models are converging to say transformers. And then I wonder how much does this affect the devices that you design? And then sort of what future models will pe people be you know, able to efficiently train and, and inference? Okay, so so very much effects. <laughs> um, and you see, if, if you look over the years, every GPU that we've um, that we've released has something to do with something that happened in the ecosystem, and we need to um, give a solution to that. And transformers is a very big thing that happened in the ecosystem in our in our new GPU, the H100. And and by the way, this is why I said hardware is not enough. So you always need hardware and software in order to do acceleration according to the use case. And transformers is a great example for that. So if you use our A100, which is the one GPU before, um, we have software that helps transformers train better on A100s. On the H100, which is our new GPU, we have built-in support for training a, uh, transformers. Um, and again, this is something we can deep dive into. I can send you information and you can read about it, but, but it's exactly that. What happens in the ecosystem has a very big implication on the kind of GPU that we release or the kind of SK and software that we release for it. So if you guys are working with transformers, if you go into the developer zone, or even if you do Google NVIDIA transformers, you'll see both the software and the hardware that we have dedicated for this new set of, um, of AI. By the way, it's the same thing with vision transformers. So transformers today isn't only in NLP, it's also in computer vision. And for that, we have software that accelerates that as well. Okay, thank you, Laren. Uh, I think we, uh, we will give you another set of applause. Bigger one, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And next is Kairi uh, um, We'll talk about LLMs that we are doing in here in Tato, or she's doing. Um, so I, I switched on my mic and it's working, right? And I actually want to use also this. Is this also working? Uh, okay, no. Um, so yes, uh, hello, my name is Kairi Zirts and uh, I'm representing the Tartu NLP group here today, um, and my, uh, the goal of my talk is to give an overview about large language models in external language technology, or maybe more precisely, how well uh, external language is uh, kind of supported by large language models. 
but first I want to establish some, some common understanding about language models. And uh, we all know what language models are doing. Uh, they simply predict the next word, given some context. And uh, these kinds of language models have been around for more than 40 years, since the beginning of 80s, when uh, n-gram language models were uh, utilized in automatic speech recognition system. And uh, these n-gram language models, they can actually be also pretty large, even larger than those large language models we are talking about today. So they could take uh, several tens of gigabytes of memory. But, um, oh, okay, sorry, wrong button. Uh, but the, the context in these n-gram language models was pretty limited, and the representation of this context uh, was shallow. Whereas in these large language models that we're talking about today, the context can be pretty large, and as far as I know, the um, context length of the um, latest GPT-4, the largest model, which I guess is not publicly available yet, is something like 40 to 50 pages of text, which is pretty impressive, and the representation is very deep, um, which is one of the reasons why they work so well. Uh, now, transformers, before I, somebody would ask you, before 2017, what is a transformer? Maybe this is the association you got. Um, but things changed. Uh, in 2017, Osmani et al. published a paper, Attention is all you need. Um, where they proposed transformer architecture, which is a kind of feed-forward architecture which underlies uh, the contempor all contemporary large language models. And I believe that the semantic meaning change has sort of changed. So if somebody says transformers, you're probably maybe not thinking about those uh, figures anymore, at least some people. Uh, the crucial component is the transformer architecture self-attention, where each word looks at the context, uh, at, at each other word in its context, and based on that, that uh, based on that information, creates a new representation. Uh, and if you put those um, self-attention layers many times on top of each other, then it creates a deep, very contextualized representation that can represent um, very elaborate um, uh, aspects about both structure and meaning. Uh, another aspect I would like to mention about the architecture is that some models are encoder-only, uh, such as BERT and Roberta. So they are trained on something called uh, must language modeling, where some words in the, con uh, in the text are must, and uh, they are predicted uh, based on the context. context. And these uh, models cannot be used for generation, then again, they can be only used for encoding some input. Uh, then there are other models that are decoder only, the GPT family is such, and uh, these model, models are meant for text generation. And then there are encoder decoder models, such as T5 and BART, and uh, these are typically used for conditional generation tasks, such as um, text summarization, question answering. And to finish this very short introduction to language models, uh, this is the typical use case. First, there is free training. Uh, this is done on large amounts of raw text using unsupervised objectives. It typically takes um, several weeks on several GPUs, means it's pretty costly, but the result is a kind of a generic model that knows a lot about language. And then comes fine-tuning, which is done, uh, which means uh, pre-training uh, or, or fine-tuning these pre-trained models on some task-specific data, and uh, the result is a specific model that can solve some particular task. And this is typically can be done on a single GPU, takes much less time. Uh, all right. But uh, now let's talk about large language models for Estonian language. And here is a figure about the timeline, uh, how these language models have emerged. 
And uh, what I want to do next is to sort of uh, put the models that support Estonian also on this figure, removing some stuff that is maybe not so relevant at this point for us. So let's start with the encoder-only models. And the first thing is, of course, BERT that uh, uh, emerged in the late 2018. And at the same time came also MBERT, which is the multilingual version of BERT, uh, supports 100 languages, including Estonian. And two years later, in our group, we also trained the Estonian-specific BERT. And uh, as BERT was trained on couple, uh, roughly 1.2 billion words, it was trained a little bit more than two weeks on four GPUs, uh, and it has been evaluated on a number of NLP tasks for which we have uh, data, uh, some simpler tasks such as part of speech tagging, morphological tagging, but also sentiment classification, name identity recognition. And uh, it has been also uh, evaluated on other tasks like extractive question answering, dialogue intent detection, and probably others which um, I, might, I might not even know everything. And uh, based on our experiments, what we can say is uh, this expert is better than multilingual BERT. Uh, then there is Roberto, which is essentially BERT, but uh, slightly bigger. Uh, there are some differences in training. Uh, and there is also the multilingual version of uh, Roberto. And there are also two versions of Estonian specific uh, Roberta, one of them is uh, NVIDIA, as Roberta. NVIDIA is a consortium of um, academic institutions. Uh, our group is not part of it. And uh, we also have one Estonian Roberta model trained in our group, which uh, was fine tuned from this excellent Roberta. Uh, it was also trained actually in the end of 2021, but uh, only became available in the beginning of this year. Uh, so the sizes, so the auto NLP model is trained on roughly 1.3 billion words, and the NVIDIA model roughly 2.5 billion words. Uh, what we do know is that this excellent Roberta is on par with SBERT in some tasks a bit better, on some tasks maybe a bit uh, worse. Um, the um, Language-specific uh, Roberta models, NVIDIA and Tartar NLP models, they have not been systematically evaluated at this point. Um, what I can say about, uh, uh, based on uh, preliminary experiments, that, uh, that our model is probably better than SBIRT and XLM Roberta, but the NVIDIA model is probably better than ours, which is one reason could be that their training set size was just two times as big as ours. Uh, let's look at decoder-only models, so GPT, GPT-2, GPT-3. Uh, we also have GPT models called GPT-4, EST, two versions, base and large. It doesn't mean it's GPT-4, it means it's for Estonian. <laughs> uh, it's actually GPT-2 architecture. Uh, and uh, the training data was roughly 2.1 billion words. And the largest, large model was trained up to 19 days on four GPUs. And uh, let's look at some anecdotes, how it works. So you know, Estonians know, this is the um, novel by Oskar Lutz, Spring, the first sentence uh, of that novel. So this is what this sentence should be. Uh, when Arno and his father arrived at the schoolhouse, classes had already be begun. Uh, what the model generates? based on this prefix, is something more humorous. Uh, um, when Arno and his, his father arrived at the schoolhouse, he was already so old that he no longer understood what was happening. This is the base model, so what the large, mo large model is doing um, gets even more humorous, I would say. Like, when Arno and his father arrived, he was already so big that he could no longer fit through the door. So these are anecdotes. But the truth is that uh, this GPT for EST model hasn't been systematically evaluated. Uh, main reasons being that we don't have really good uh, evaluation sets or evaluation uh, settings to do that. And so we have to uh, be happy with these kind of anecdotes at this point. Um, 
Okay, but let's look at encoder decoder models as well. Uh, so there are T5, multilingual T5, also includes Estonian. Uh, recently it was published uh, Flan T5, also multilingual model, should be better than multi MT5. Um, there is BART, there is MBART, multilingual, also includes Estonian. So what I can say about those is that I don't know any uh, evaluations about MT5 on Estonian. Maybe somebody has done something, but not something I am, I'm aware of. Uh, I know that MBART has been evaluated on abstractive summarization uh, by our, our colleagues from the, uh, Tallinn University of Technology. And SBART has been recently trained. It's currently under evaluation. It's not available yet. And finally, let's also put the JetGPT on the picture. This is also a multilingual model. It knows something about Estonian. And uh, it can be pretty cool. So I asked about this proverb. Whoever does not pick up a penny does not get the crown. So what does it mean? Uh, it explains really well in Estonian. And this English one is the translation of the Estonian explanation. Uh, it means that taking small steps and paying attention to small things can eventually lead to great achievements. It means that if a person does not pay attention to the small details and opportunities, they may miss out on the larger opportunities that those details or opportunities could offer. This can apply to both financial and other areas of life. So pr pretty verbose, but I mean, good explanation. But it can lack local context. So if you ask, what is the first sentence of Anna Karenina? It knows all unhappy, fam all happy families are alike. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. But when you ask about this first sentence of the novel Spring, it hallucinates something about when spring came. I got into my cart and drove towards the town. Um, so, in summary, uh, it's a sub-summary. Uh, we do have several Estonian-specific models, like Espert, Estroberta, GPTS, soon as BART. Uh, we do have several multilingual models that include Estonian, including Excellent Roberta, MT5, MBART, JetGPT, GPT4. Uh, I can confidently say that SBIRT has been most thoroughly tested, whereas other models have been sporadically tested or not tested at all. And the last uh, part of my talk uh, addresses some open questions and challenges. And uh, the first of them is lack of pre-training data. So we saw that the largest Estonian model was trained on 2.5 billion words, which may sound a lot, but uh, GPT-3 on English was trained on 500 billion words, and uh, ChatGPT, GPT-4 probably even more. So the difference is 200 times. So, and that uh, quite probably has an impact. So what to do? One option, um, create synthetic data. And this is something uh, that is being done in our lab right now. Uh, so roughly six, 67 giga tokens has been translated from various uh, languages. And there are several ways how to use this data. For instance, um, train uh, models with synthetic data, either from scratch or fine-tune from some multilingual model. Or train on real data versus some mix of real and synthetic data, and then continue on real data only and see which works best. The second issue is lack of task-specific data. Um, when we look at this kind of low-level, somewhat boring tasks, so to say, like part of speech tagging, morphology, syntax, I would say that the picture is not perfect, but pretty good. Uh, when we look at the kind of middle-level tasks, sentiment, named entities, maybe also uh, extractive question answering, well, we do have something, but we would, of course, have more. And when we look at these high-level tasks, uh, like abstract, ab abstractive question answering, summarization, reasoning tasks, then um, we have only very few examples. We have only very few data sets that we can use. Uh, what to do? Of course, we can create uh, language-specific data sets for both training and test. And uh, that's time-consuming. It's costly. Uh, 
Another option is, okay, there are data sets, maybe in English, perhaps we can translate something, translate training sets, uh, translate test sets, um, but translated test sets can also have some biases, uh, as was shown recently in a, a paper published by our group. And uh, another option that has been experimented with uh, by our colleagues in Tallinn University of Technology is inference via translation, which means that the model is actually not in Estonian, model is in English, only the test data is Estonian, it's first translated into English, then passed through the English model, and the result is translated back to Estonian. Uh, and it worked uh, the best in the case of abstractive summarization on news transcripts. But of course, there are also potential problems and caveats with that option. Finally, I'd like to uh, also mention the cost of pre-training. Um, pre-training takes several weeks on several GPUs, which means it costs money. And that means that we need to uh, constantly think where to direct our resources. What should we do? Should we train more monolingual models on synthetic data? Try to get some more real data? Should we fine-tune multilingual models? Or maybe we should simply wait until open AI models get better, and we should uh, focus our attention to evaluating these models. Uh, it's not clear at all. Um, and now I actually come to the summary. So we do, in summary, we do have several Estonian-specific and multilingual models in all types of uh, architectures, encoder only, decoder only, encoder, decoder, uh, more data would be beneficial, of course. Raw text for pre-training, uh, various task-specific test sets for fine-tuning and model evaluation. Uh, I think we need to uh, systematically evaluate the existing multilingual models to know how well they uh, perform in our language on uh, various tasks. And the last thing I would like to say that even though these uh, large language models are multilingual, the world of large language models is, is still English language centric, maybe not specific, but centric. And that means that uh, we uh, need to put in effort to um, make what we can to support smaller languages such as Estonian. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot for your presentation. It was very interesting to listen. <clears throat> you mentioned that, like, um, one, last of, one of the last slides, that um, to increase data set, you can use translation, and that translated data set is biased. Can you give a more details, like, what kind of bias uh, is created there? Um, well, oh. I am doing, okay. So, um, I was not uh, the author of this paper, so, uh, I'm not sure if I get all the details right, but uh, I think in a nutshell it was something like this, that uh, if we um, uh, train the model on actual data, but um, evaluate on translated data, then we can uh, overestimate what, how the model would perform on like kind of native data. Because there are certain, you know, trans um, passing, um, well, first of all, uh, tra translated data sets, um, the translation system itself uh, has, can have its specifics. And the other thing is that if you take a, a data set that is created, for instance, in US or somewhere else, there could be, um, I mean, the content could be also somehow not relevant to our con context or something like this. Hi. Oh, hi. So... My question is, uh, since we are talking about LLMs, so how much room do you think ChatGPT leaves for other models to evolve? Because it's going to get better and better with time, so what are your opinions on that? Uh, I don't think I know the answer. <laughs> Research is always good. How, how, how would I know? <laughs> but, yeah, uh, no. <laughs> uh, but I think the thing is that we need to evaluate these models, like how well they are performing. I mean, 
you know, face value things might look great when we put in like anecdot anecdotal examples, but to systematically evaluate on different tasks, different languages, I think that is something that needs to be done. I have a trickier question. How do you separate the input that we trust or is correct versus gibberish input to the systems? Fake news. Uh, how, do I, um, how do you encode that in the data even? I don't know. And I'm not sure it's there. <laughs> because, uh, I mean, fact checking or considering whether something is uh, correct or not, uh, it's, a, it's a problem on its own, which is unsolved. <laughs> and I'm not sure that a large language model, like, without any extra effort, solves this problem. So there is a room of improvement for yeah, chat, yeah, GPT. Sure. <laughs> uh, now we start up. Uh, uh, so you mentioned two possibilities of getting an Estonian specific model. One is basically from scratch, learning from random initialization. Later yeah. you also mentioned uh, fine-tuning a multilingual model. Mm -hmm. uh, so what's the comparison? How, which one is more s promising? And uh, which ones are the expert and other models actually? Espert is trained from scratch. Uh, but this uh, Roberta that we trained, this is uh, initialized, with, it was initialized from XLM Roberta. But as I said, it's, it's not thoroughly uh, evaluated, although I believe, <laughs> based on some experiment, preliminary experiments, that it's better than XLM Roberta. Uh, however, this NVIDIA expert was trained from scratch. I saw three hands, I can only take one question, okay. Um. Thanks for the presentation. Um, GPT-4 is much better in uh, generating Estonian text than uh, 3.5, mm -hmm. the previous one. Why do you think that is, and uh, what can that tell us about multilingual models and the quality of Estonian in it? Uh, why do I? Oh, well, that's a good question. Like, why do I think? Because I don't know, <laughs> of course. But uh, there are probably differences between the uh, between uh, uh, GPT, GPT 3.5 and GPT 4, both in terms of architecture and training data. Uh, as far as I understand, the details about the architecture are not public. I haven't found them. I, so I don't know exactly like how large it is, how many layers. Uh, I haven't also found information about what exactly was the training data. Uh, but we can assume that, or believe, that the training data was larger, maybe also in terms of Estonian, and uh, the model was bigger and trained longer. That's my best guess at this moment. <laughs> okay, but you have an educated guess at least, so thank you. So let's thank uh, Kairit. She's associate professor, or soon will be, uh, teaching the classes. Please join her classes. Next, in the first uh, session, we will have also about lang uh, large language models. And the presentation is by Zenodia Charpy, senior deep learning data scientist at NVIDIA. Maybe, maybe we have some answers from there. Do, you, do we get also the video of Zenodia? Uh, I'm here. Hello, nice <laughs> to see you. Would you like me to share my screen? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, as you can see, uh, this is the pic that, that I'd like to talk about. So, um, basically, it's about leveraging how, if you already have or if you would like to train, and if you, you, you would like to leverage the large language models in the context of enterprise usage. So, the way that I'm going to go through the talk is the following. So uh, we're going to take a look at of a few selected use cases that's leveraging LLM technology. So um, in the following, I'm going to interchange LLMs, uh, stands for large language models <laughs> uh, with LLM. So I'm just going to, you know, shorthand it and just say LLM. And after we have 
use cases, uh, we are going to probably put um, some cl clarifications upon like, you know, there's only <laughs> the OpenAI ChatGPT and then ChatGPT styled model, but um, most of the models that we've seen or um, is making in the making are foundational models. So uh, there's a difference between them. And the best guess is of what we think um, can go from foundational model to ChatGPT styled model. So not like exact that one, because, you know, as the previous speaker said that, you know, there's no exact paper or architecture about it. Uh, then probably it is interesting for you guys to know that what we are doing <laughs> and we are doing in this domain, uh, the generative AI and LLMs. And there's a few things that's been touched on uh, in the previous um, in the previous talk as well about like, you know, hallucinate, uh, factoring correctness and so on. And this, I will also uh, at the end of the sessions talk about how we see that you to provide you tools in, in order to customize uh, the workflow to address or starting to address to these type of problems. Right, um, let's get started. So first thing we're going to talk about is a few selected use cases, um, but but I like to set the scene in the context of like human collaborating. So so it's like a collaborating scene with the LLMs. So so not like you know Terminator takeover type of scenario. It's more like, you know that's collaborate. So how do we do that, right? With a few select use cases. Uh, the first case I'd like to show you guys is co-authoring. Okay, so um, there are three use cases. Um, each of them are in the mode of like say drafting. So, so uh, when you prompt the large language models, you can uh, get it continues to write drafts for you. For example, for email or story generations or content for the web page generations, product description generations, blog post generation, and so on, or Twitter or whatever. And for the enterprise scenario, usually you will have a specific person having specific role uh, aligned with the, the company directive when it comes to products and services, and they need to produce those content on a daily basis. And sometimes they can hit like um, a blocker uh, in the sense that, you know, okay, I've been doing this every day, it's quite boring, what should I do? And then you can co-author with the large language models in order to get like inspirations, at the same time help you offload to a certain degree. And in the following slide, I'd like to show you LLMs that's in a different domain. So in the sense that you can co-compose music and or co-generate data with the LLMs. Uh, as you can see on the left hand side, if you trained a language model, so, so normally people think about language model, they are usually trained on um, uh, natural language data, you know, that you can find on the web and then, you know, uh, the transcribed data that people were talking about in the conversation or in the chat room forum. However, uh, you can, if you want to, and it has been done to um, uh, train the language model on music notes, right? Because music by itself is a language as well. So this type of model, once trained, uh, as you can see, you can manipulate the music note. So in this case, uh, the model is trained on like a piano roll kind of thing per instrument. And um, you can, for example, here, the prompt that you manipulate the music note is track start instrument drums. So I specified that it has to be drums that I'm interested in nothing else. And then I give a few note. And then I wanted to generate drums. And then I'd like to invite you guys to listen to what it generate. Uh, in this case, it's drum. Similarly, we can also um, fit the large language model training on data that's structured data, such as, you know, uh, tabular data that's comma separated. Uh, if the model is trained on this type of data with a specialized tokenizer, you can make the model generate more data synthetically. So, so why is it useful? Well, 
a lot of enterprise, um, finance institute, um, police, uh, government, they all have proprietary data that's sensitive and then cannot be shared even between their own within internal departments. And so if the large language model has the ability to absorb these data and generate synthetic data that can both be used for simulation purposes, analysis purpose, and or sharing or research purposes. So uh, this is being looked into quite um, uh, quite in depth, and there are companies, and uh, they are in the commercial space, really help enterprise uh, in the synthetic data generation space using large language models capability. Okay, so the last use case I'm going to show you is in the healthcare domain. So if you um, if you feed the language model with uh, molecule information, such as we're seeing on the left-hand side of the screen, and you train this model, uh, you know, like um, previously you mentioned um, uh, the encoder-decoder type of model, and this type of model uh, that you have seen here is BART model. So once it's trained, you can sample uh, from the latent space here in the middle, I hope you can actually see my uh, cursor, <laughs> my mouse cursor is here. And, and then you, if you uh, have the domain knowledge and as well as knowing how to sample and control the latent um, representation, then you can, in the next slide, traverse this latent space and able to generate chemical molecule with the desired property in the uh, context of drug discovery. And this has been looked into by companies such as, you know, AstraZeneca and so on. So we've seen a few use cases, but these, all of the above, is in the uh, context of co-working, co-authoring, collaborating uh, with the uh, language model. And these type of language model that we have just gone are foundational models. So uh, foundational models are not tweaked or aligned to human preferences. Whereas the chat GPT style models in this sense is uh, more aligned toward human preferences. And the closest that we can find that's public available is the following, where if you take a very strong, very good foundational model, and then you, if you have a set of um, uh, data that's already annotated, labeled, you know, with gold example and everything, such as open assistant uh, data set, you can supervise fine tune on uh, the, the foundational model on those data. Afterwards, you can um, have human, uh, a lot of them, interact with this model and get the response Afterwards, you have to construct a reward model uh, in order to align to human preferences. So the responses will be ranked. And this is like, you know, <laughs> still experimenting. I mean, at NVIDIA, we're experimenting those things as well. So um, after you have your reward model, a solid one that you uh, know that you can use to align, then you um, train the model uh, the, now that is the supervised fine-tuned already model, and then you use reinforcement learning to find the best policy to align to this reward model, and then they're, thereafter align to the human preferences. So uh, this is obviously a research topic in basically <laughs> all the enterprises' mind. Good. So um, now I'd like to <laughs> show you in the following uh, slides, what are we doing at NVIDIA? So exactly what are we doing in this generative AI and large language model space? Let's find out. Um, so NVIDIA at the, the last GTC, which is not so long time ago in March, uh, has announced uh, NVIDIA AI Foundation, which is on the left-hand side, they are all a service. So, so these are, for example, uh, from the left to the right, you have the NVIDIA NEMO service, which is NVIDIA's serving our own large language models. 
So they ranging from size like 5 billion, 8 billion, 20 billion, 43 billion, 530 billion parameters. And also show up in the previous speakers, you know, the Megatron Turing 530 billion parameters. They are all autoregressive GPT styled model, foundational models. And in that service also offer some customization such as, you know, prompt tuning, P tuning technology uh, for customization uh, on specific downstream labeled data. And this is, these are type of parameter efficient fine tuning technique. Uh, so, uh, sorry, not fine tuning, tuning technique. And then we also going to offer inform, uh, which is retrieval type of model that is uh, suitable for enterprise usage as a customization within the service. So uh, these services that I talk about, they are either as an API call, they also come with the playground user interface as well as the customization. Now, when it comes to domain specifics, as I have previously touched on, we do have um, a healthcare specific uh, type of data that, that, that needs to be taken care of, which is very different from the natural language. And in this space, the BioNemo service and offer the uh, domain trained uh, foundational models. And these models are protein sequencing type of model and can help you to, for example, toward precision medicine um, per your uh, DNA sequence and thereafter the pro uh, to specially design traverse the latent space that I was talking about to um, for the drug that's made for your specific DNAs in that sense. So again, this is like a domain that's a researchy, and, but, but this is an interesting domain. And we also offer that as a service, comes with a playground um, as well as support. Last but not least, we have the NVIDIA Picasso service that's um, and capturing the ethical aspects of the diffusion model space. I'm gonna talk more about that later. Uh, in the next slide, in fact. So uh, out of these, these are as a service, as in, you know, just like uh, OpenAI and or a Hugging Face Diffusion model, if you just want to, you know, try it out and figure it out in the exploratory phase, uh, what is this about? Uh, you can do that. But uh, if you look at most of um, the enterprise scenario, there are sometimes, most of the time, you will have, uh, you will have domains specific data and or proprietary data that's just not existing and or the the as a service um, the oh it's just not good enough it hallucinate it doesn't uh, give you um, exactly what you actually requested for and in that sense people might want to train their own foundational model or tune their foundational model and in that case, we move on to the right-hand side where we provide both a framework as well as a, a service that encapsulated the entire pipeline that meets you every step of the way, whether you don't know how to scale in order to train very large language model on a super pod or in the cloud, we help you there. And, but more on that later. That's uh, get back a bit and talk a little bit more about diffusion model and the service. Okay, so um, generally, you query diffusion model as following. You give a text prompt, uh, for example, on the left hand side, you say, I'm gonna, I want to have a, a, dog, a, a cat uh, that, uh, <laughs> that's been painted with the pink and blue neon color as a splash, something like that. And then you are gonna get a image out. Or you can condition uh, these type of models by supplying a image as a template. And then you either edit it or that you use that um, you control it in order to generate with the preconditioned image to generate the, the image of that you desire. So the Nemo framework in the next slide support both of that. So that's from the image perspective, whether that's stable diffusion or vision transformers or clip or instruct pix to pix or dream booth. Uh, in that space, if you tune your model and you would like to um, uh, just to deploy it as a service and you don't know how to optimize and you don't know what compute is necessary, you don't know how to meet the latency versus throughput trade-off requirement, 
because you know as a service you need to meet a certain certain service level agreement then we can help you there now if you want to train a foundational um, uh, diffusion model from scratch. We also have Edify, where it is license compliant uh, for commercial usage. So most of the data um, that train on for those diffusion models, there are a lot of um, <laughs> controversy out there, like, you know, it's uh, patent, my, my uh, infringed patent of someone else's work, or that it's not license compliant for all the data that is trained on because it crawled the web and so on. So Edify is, in that particular case, trained on specifically licensing compliant data in order to address to this type of enterprise concern and or legal sensitivity concern. OK, so NEMO framework is not only composed of the image model, it also more famously known for large language models. So we support these you know, encoder, decoder, encoder, and decoder type of model, that is BERT, T5, mixture of expert, T5 and T5, GPT, 123, inform, uh, inform uh, is, is our way of saying uh, anchor this product name, but actually it is a retrieval type of model. So comes with this framework, comes with model parallelism that help you to scale so whether you want to train GPT-2 or GPT-3 or larger, all the way to, let's say, one trillion parameter of the model, you would require um, the framework to support that. Not, you cannot just scale the compute. You have to also scale in the sense of the software. And that comes with the model parallelism. It comes with 3D parallelism. So data parallelism comes for free from PyTorch. You have tensor, pipeline, sequence parallelism, coupled with selective activation checkpointing. Yeah. So when it comes to customization, we do offer a range of prompt tuning, parameter efficient tuning uh, type of customization, as well as adapter, uh, supervised fine tuning, reinforcement learning with human feedback, and so on. When it comes to compute, it can be hard to uh, fit the uh, to, to, to understand how, how, how many GPU do I need if I have this amount of data? How big a model do I need to train? And also, if I train the model with this fixed configuration, would it be um, optimal for inferencing runtime and so on? So these are all questions that um, comes uh, with, with when you want to train your own foundational model and or deploy them at scale. And then we offer auto configuration tool to help you in that sense to automatically find those configuration optimal for your chosen use case. When it comes to compute, so that's last but not least, when it comes to compute, um, we support multiple cloud. As you can see, whether your cloud is in Oracle, AWS, Microsoft, or N NVIDIA DGX cloud, or you want to train it in your on-prem if you are lucky to have access to a NVIDIA SuperPod, uh, such as the case we have here in Sweden. And then you also can train on-prem and or in the cloud or, you know, on-prem and in the cloud hybrid. So in a nutshell, this is a framework that's optimized full stack from the compute layer all the way uh, to, um, to the software layer that help you to train and deploy for real the model to productions um, on a range of foundational models. So what are we doing in this space? What we're trying to help our customer. So uh, our customers usually is enterprise customers, and then they are, are having a different adoption phase because this is a new technology, right? Generative AI, large language models. So whether they are in the stage where they just want to explore, that's on the upper right hand side. You know, you just get an API call and then you query it and then you see what happens. Or you are in the phase where you decide that, hey, guess what? I'm going to train my own foundational model. Such is the case you probably have seen uh, the Bloomberg GPT kind of models where they train their own from scratch. Then in that case, oh, or the customers is everything in between the spectrum. So we support basically every level in that sense. 
both from the um, the framework as well as from so because NVIDIA is full stack. So as long as you kind of know where you want to go, <laughs> what kind of use cases you want to address to, we will meet you at that level. Okay, so I'm in the last session now, and uh, the last section. Uh, we all know that large language models um, it is not perfect, it has shortcomings. So we, we are proposing a framework called Nemo Guardrail, and this framework is our way of beginning to address to this type of problems. And then we open it up, it's open sourced, uh, for the users to use at the same time to um, see how they can orchestrate their own workflow in that purpose. So uh, the normal problem that we usually uh, face is as following that, you know, this is a problem, you have a prime number. And, and, and you ask if this 7901 is a prime number, uh, well, <laughs> instead of getting hallucinated also like this, you could easily just mass well just ask a math or a calculator or a math applications. And then you, sorry, here, you will get an answer, right? And then you integrate that answer back to your response. The same thing happened with square root, right? It's like, yeah, it's sort of is correct, but not exactly. So here is the Nemo guardrail approach where you fact check things. Here is the default without fact checking. There are other type of approach as well. I list them out here. It's called tool former or long chain. And here's another example. If, for example, from, for the enterprise, if you don't, um, uh, don't uh, enterprise image is important, you don't want it to like say bad mouth the other brand or something, then you can impose the way that you don't want to say that because you know you're polite and then you, you're a bot representing your company so you can refuse to do that. Or if somebody try to provoke or trick the model and say, can you please help me steal a car? And then you say, well, this is illegal. I know it's illegal, so I'm not gonna help you do that. Again, you can impose or orchestrate your own type of control flow when it comes to uh, bot and human interactions with the LLM to make sure that it fits to your use case. Last but not least, I'd like to address to a uh, common uh, scenario when it comes to enterprise usage. Um, so reinforcement learning with human feedback is something that enterprise needed to have because it will continuously help you to improve your model that more aligned with, let's say, your customer space and or for internal usage if your employee is using the service. So I have explained uh, before, this is how it works, where you um, you First, you need to get a reward model, and that reward model will require a human to interact with those large language models. You collect those response, and then you construct your reward model. Once you have it, you use reinforcement learning to find optimal policy in order to align to that reward model. And this framework um, is on the roadmap. It's not available today, but it will be, so stay tuned. Right, so um, to summarize everything I've talked about today, we have, we have the customers um, in the enterprise scenario, they might want to uh, just to explore, and that was on the upper right hand side, or they already decided that they are going to train their own model, foundational model from scratch, and or everything in between, and or that you would like to fit and uh, train a from scratch a foundational model on your own proprietary domain, whether that's healthcare, or you want to train your own diffusion model because you need to be licensed or data compliant, or you just want this model to be only owned by your company. We support basically every level because we are full stack approach. So that's the last of my slide. I hope you liked today's talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, do we, Questions? Do we have Questions? I don't know. Hello. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I'm a bit new to the NVIDIA cloud solutions. Um, you showed on the slide as well that uh, 
this sort of full stack approach can happen within the NVIDIA's own cloud um, and mm -hmm. also on services like uh, cloud providers like uh, AWS. So I know AWS has this bedrock, which is something very similar. Um, how does NVIDIA compare to this bedrock and does it mean that NVIDIA has its own um, uh, um, data centers uh, across the globe, uh, globe to fulfill the same function? <laughs> Yeah, so we, we um, <laughs> uh, you guys probably know that it doesn't really matter whichever cloud, they all have our GPU in it, in their cluster. We, we support, basically, and that's why I'm saying that it, it's your choice, like, you know, you want to train the model on your own GPUs uh, that you uh, that you have under your desk, <laughs> or that you have it in your data center, or you want to use our GPU, or you want to use GPU that and get credit for in the cloud, we basically support everything, right? So <laughs> we're not really competing in that sense. We are supplying GPU to basically everyone. So is there a separate cloud offered only by NVIDIA or you're working with other cloud providers? Uh, we infrared? do work with the other, yeah, we do work with the other uh, cloud providers. So um, depending on uh, the needs, um, so so I, I don't really know anything about pricing, but we do um, have sort of like this kind of licensing agreement when it comes to uh, service. Uh, it, it, let's say if you want to use, um, you know, as a service that I have said, and then comes with a service you can customize, which, which means that you need compute. <laughs> and if you don't mind, you know, upload the data because it's not sensitive, because you're just trying it out, you know, POC or whatever, and, and then we can have this uh, compute in our NVIDIA cloud, or you say, no, I, I, I like to have it on Oracle cloud, then the compute will be on Oracle cloud. <laughs> okay. It's in that context, yes. Okay, so NVIDIA has its own separate cloud provider similar to AWS that we can opt into using. And I wouldn't say that. I would say that, um, you know, um, if you think about the cloud concept, basically cloud is basically you um, you don't know where it is. It, you have a data center, but you don't know where it is. And then you can use the service, right? You know, NVIDIA has a really large cluster as well, such as our internal ceiling. And uh, that could be considered as a cloud <laughs> if you want, but you don't have to <laughs> as well. So in that sense, um, we, how do I put it? Um, we don't actually mind where you want to do the compute. We just want to support you in that sense. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thank you, Zenodia. So mm -hmm. I also took the message that for not for everything we need to convert first to LLM model. That for music there could be also music specific models, right? Oh yes, yes. It's not um, only the we have... not the only hammer. In the toolbox. No, uh, I actually helped um, a, a, um, a, uh, a AI guru. He's in German. Uh, he he trained. He he co composed with um, with his own trained <laughs> music uh, language models, and that's the one that I show. Yeah, we have one research yeah. group doing music AI in here. But thanks thanks again. Um, thank you. Applause. Yeah. Hi guys. And we have just over 20, about 20 minutes break, maybe 20, maybe we will stretch it to 25 minutes, coffee, snacks. Uh, thank you everybody from the morning, uh, from the first session. We will meet again soon. Okay, we will continue the session. And uh, as you can see, no, don't, don't yet. Keep the session info. Yeah, thank you. You can see there are biases in the data. There are biases in the data. In the first session, we had all female uh, speaker lineup. And in the second session, we have all male lineup of the speakers. So we will turn left. No, the other left uh, in here. We will start switching gears. No, somebody else does it for us. Uh, so we will, enter, we will enter the autonomous driving um, session. It's um, cool how there are these uh, biases. Um, but uh, our first speaker is Fabian Weiss from uh, NVIDIA, Senior Deep Learning Software Engineer. Fabian, uh, I saw that you are ready and we, we can give you the floor, please. All right, thank you very much. 
So um, yeah, my talk will be about the supercharging of systems with GPU acceleration in terms of the autonomous driving at scale. So um, the agenda will be that I'll first talk about a bit about the um, E2 workflow, so the end-to-end -end workflow, uh, partly about the simulation as the last segment of the general workflow, and then we'll continue on how that scales nowadays, maybe how that scaled in the past, and I'll also have a few more words um, over the complete software stack um, in my wrap-up words in the very end. So as you know, AI changed a majority of industries, maybe almost all industries, and is the driving force of our time. So thinking about healthcare, um, gaming with um, DLSS, super sampling, uh, high resolution image, um, in finance, in retail. So it changed almost all industries. And one of the industries is transportation. That is one of the um, major efficiency problems that the world is maybe facing today. Because think about how much time um, you could save when instead of driving yourself, you could do uh, something else while driving. So maybe you could work or um, like work for your job or uh, for personal projects, uh, you could enjoy more of your lifetime. Think about how much time you spend with commuting and how um, much more cost efficient it would be if um, transportations for uh, goods would be um, optimized a bit more. And that all goes into the domain of autonomous vehicles, so AV and autonomous driving and autonomous cars. <clears throat> That's actually a very different problem because it faces um, so many different challenges from across the whole range of all AI applications. And um, that, as Zenodia said, um, said earlier um, about LLMs, not only includes these LLMs, for example, when you want to interact with your car in terms of uh, bringing you to a certain destination and you don't want to type it in with some touchpad, but maybe via voice recognition, um, but it also scales to robotics, um, to uh, HPC computing, uh, computer vision, and uh, last but not least, also reinforcement learning. So here you see the general pipeline or the general building blocks of such an autonomous vehicle end-to-end um, -end workflow. So generally, one can say that before you start with anything, that the data is like super important without data. Um, there's no way that your car uh, will be able to maneuver at the very end by yourself because the opposite of the deep learning domain would be, for example, that uh, have a set of defined rules and um, yeah, implement that. And that is, uh, has been proven um, to not be feasible. So um, the workflow itself, right? So it starts with the sensor set that your car needs to be equipped with in order to model this whole world. That includes maybe cameras, sliders, and radars. And um, this data needs to be collected, needs to be encoded, and also it needs to be sent to some cloud. And we're talking here about 1.6 petabyte per day that needs to be securely transported, encoded, and stored. Um, just some information about the old days when I joined NVIDIA was um, that when we had these safety drivers, and we were deploying uh, our hardware and software inside the car and testing it. Uh, there were several SSDs, each with like many ter terabytes of data. And back then, it's not too long ago, maybe three or four or five years, something like that. Uh, I recall that we took all the SSDs and instead of uploading them, there was too much data to upload them. We had to ship it via plane, actually. It was much faster um, to, uh, yeah, to synchronize the data instead of just uploading it to the cloud like all the solutions that we have right now. Then by the time it's uploaded to the cloud or to some servers of your choice, you need to curate the data and you need to label it. So that is a very, very um, tedious task because you need to precisely label. There are different types of annotations that you can do, coarse annotations, fine annotations, and um, it's, it's very costly. And then after the learning has been done, um, all the data is then being processed inside the training. You generate AI models that are doing the perception for you on very strong computers. And um, 
then before we go to the simulation, you need to replay the data. That is basically by the recordings that you have taken, you uh, replay these recordings and you check out if your trained AI models work on such a replay. Um, you do that in autonomous fashion and you also do that in uh, human verification fashion um, by checking corner cases and then checking, hey, okay, that car is not labeled correctly. The bounding box may be a bit off or maybe a different object was um, was uh, bounded by a box. Um, so as soon as you have passed that replay, then you go over to the simulation and that's where all the magic in terms of scaling now this happens. <clears throat> so um, yeah, generally speaking, NVIDIA um, provides that whole stack of software and hardware that uh, goes from all the uh, stuff that you need to collect the data, uh, as I said, hardware and software to train the models and data centers to DGX and uh, training as inference solutions, then um, simulation, um, the NCAP driving test um, featurette inside um, other stack parts, as well as IX and even remote control for your operating fleet via RC. So it's really the whole stack that is um, provided here by NVIDIA. And that makes it so challenging because what we also believe is you need to get that pipeline end to end down. Because if you don't, and you just uh, work on one single field and you don't combine everything, the, the transportation or the transfer to the cloud, maybe it needs to be super optimized because so much data. And then you maybe have over the air updates for your car. So it needs also be fed back, right? So both hardware, the sending device, the um, receiving device, so the cloud infrastructure, as well as then the against the receiving device inside the car over the air, uh, all needs to be super updated, like the encoding um, uh, algorithms need to be super stable and uh, super fast, and also the whole inference pipeline for both training and inference needs to be very, very optimized. And not only are, you talking, uh, are we talking about like latency and uh, how fast things are, the speed of it, but also about safety. And that is um, a major component here that is encapsulated under Drive AV because we also offer like these NCAP driving tests. So that in uh, simulation that you would um, test against these NCAP driving tests and then deploy to your vehicle to bring it on the road. Mm -hmm. So this is how the brain the AI inside a car basically looks like. So you uh, are training, testing, and developing your model. Then you're deploying it inside uh, onto your car and then maybe fetching it back to the data center so that the model is then updated and the model in the car is updated so the car is able to learn what we so-call. And that in total includes more than 20 models. And these 20 models, um, well, they are built um, in, in a certain way. So first, you're, you need to have models uh, so that your car is able to see, that your car is able to detect signs, pedestrians, other uh, segments. And then that's the easy problem or more easy problem. Then go over to a problem that is the mapping. Because now that we are able to detect all these objects, we're able to create maps, we're able to update these and even update it over the year. So for example, if there's a mapping section that wasn't seen, we fetch back the data center, retrain it eventually, that model is then updated inside the car. Mm -hmm. And the more difficult part that comes after mapping is uh, our scenarios like dry, uh, like parking, where um, you have to be very, very accurate in millimeter domain, and also the planning and behavior, because that is the core of the vehicle, right? So it's not only about detecting and having the maps, but it's now, this, uh, now, now the situation of deciding, do I have to take the turn left, right? Do I have to stop, maneuver the car? All right, so how does that now um, scale kind of? And for that, we need to uh, talk first about the simulation because that's the major part before such models actually get deployed onto um, a real car, meaning onto the road um, with uh, safety critical uh, observation and safety critical standards. So for that, NVIDIA is generally providing um, a platform called NVIDIA Omniverse. Mm -hmm. So it's doing a lot of things for you, like it's providing a single world model, it's also applied in gaming, uh, there's ray tracing for you, it's super scalable, and um, it's applied over a very wide range of fields. So that is not only autonomous driving, but 
well, it's particularly gaming, for example, or even everything that is inside the car and with which you can interact with the eyes, the, um, yeah, whatever you can think of, think of that um, is uh, robotics driven, maybe graphics driven, uh, in some kind of way it needs some simulation to bring the simulated data onto some model in the real world data. We call that simulation to real, sim to real. And for the autonomous <clears throat> testing and validation case, what we are particularly interested in is the um, data set here. So I said, initially we collect the data from the real world. For example, uh, think about you have now stars, you let them drive over the whole planet uh, globally, and um, you are now evaluating your data set as uh, maybe the data science engineer um, working on these data sets. And for each region, you would need to check, okay, do I have enough data of, for example, California weather data? Do I have enough snow data, night data? It's all right. It needs to be pretty balanced. And um, so that it's not biased at the very end, um, you also need to check corner cases. And that is, as I said, super tedious because it scales by the number of cars that you have and by the number of drivers. So at the very end, it's very costly and not really scalable. So the simulation provides you a way that you accelerate that data collection, you uh, have a bit more data generation, data, data augmentation, and the whole speed of the training is by a very, very um, big X factor. Then for edge cases, uh, NVIDIA Omniverse provides you the ability to rebuild certain scenarios that are very difficult um, to capture. Maybe <clears throat> you have some construction on the road that you want to capture, but without the construction, because you know it will be ready in a year or so, then you could even remove the construction and uh, make a simulation just from there so that you have the training data before the construction is finished. And then the diversity. So as I said, you want to have as much nighttime data as you have um, daytime data maybe. And um, yeah, for all corner cases, you just want a very balanced and enriched data set that is not lacking behind in terms of some biases that are safety critical at some point. Right, and this pyramid here, um, that basically shows that inside the simulation, first, you have to pass that simulation in terms of NCAP and driving tests. And just when this um, simulation has been passed, meaning that you have driven a number of miles so that your model has reached a certain point of fidelity, then um, you would optimize it even further before doing this on-road testing. With the on-road testing, I don't want to call it last mile, but um, the majority is definitely inside the simulation and um, yeah, reconstruction and testing there. Um, yeah, because they are the major um, goals and errata are uh, figured out and corrected and tested. <clears throat> that not being said, needs a very strong data center because you have so many data, you need to process them all. And um, you also need to run realistic graphics on because if uh, your simulation, your simulated data doesn't look realistic, um, it will have a very bad influence on your overall performance on each of these um, AI networks that you're going to train. So NVIDIA decided to um, do synthetic data generation. That not only applies to autonomous driving, but it also applies for factories or think about reinforcement, maybe, particularly for games. So let's say um, in StarCraft, for example, right? It's a game, maybe some of you know, um, you would need to simulate that or need to have access to these APIs of this world to then train an agent based on that. And uh, that all happens in like multi-simulated uh, fashion. So you have uh, a bunch of simulations um, like uh, tons actually, in which you deploy this agent, um, you train the agent, remove after one epoch um, of uh, like one simulation epoch, um, all agents, but let's say the cleverest one, and then you start with the deployment of all cleverest ones again and so forth. Um, and similar to that is also the synthetic data generation because it's as complex. So when you have a synthetic data generation, you need to make sure that inside your simulation, it looks very real, um, really like in the real world. 
And that's much different than if you would use game engine, for example, because the challenges, challenges are just n times as big. It needs to be fully programmable, for example, it needs to be super fast. So uh, with uh, yeah, a high FPS, um, then it comes at the cost of running the data center because it's uh, creating heat, you need to cool it. Um, the data center itself is very costly. And then um, you are you're also facing the fact that it needs to be uh, pixel accurate at the very end. But the good thing is, um, is that it provides you the labels automatically, right? So for example, uh, look at these pictures here. So the corner cases here that are very difficult to label as a human being are, for example, such rare events on the left side when you have someone who's um, wearing black clothes at night and then drawing the correct bounding box across that person is super difficult. Could be that you're missing it by a few pixels already and then you introduce bias already. Uh, same goes for at nighttime, several black cars in a row. Um, it's also so uh, it's also difficult, particularly if they wouldn't have the lights turned on, for example. And then um, inside the simulation, you're simulating the whole car, you're generating that uh, with different components, um, whatever your GAN is able to deliver. So that cranked up in the past is like a lot. And all these um, label data is then perfectly labeled already. And that provides you a very, very good balance to your real data set already. Then we have the other three um, scenarios. For example, when it's very foggy, uh, you can imagine that it's maybe a bit uh, difficult to uh, let as a human being. In particular, um, the more um, or the greater the light fall off is, and the more dense the fog at the far distance becomes. Because if now, for example, you would have a very um, light or a bright car color, then um, you would maybe not be able to. Uh, draw the correct bounding boxes or um, uh, pixel segmented correctly. And then uh, the obvious case is the occlusions, particular um, important for everything. Um, that is pedestrians, objects on the road that are behind cars, uh, small children, etc. cetera. Um, they are able to uh, label the whole uh, person. And then, yeah, even if it goes beyond some sense and uh, capabilities, you would be able to um label that okay so um that's basically what that slide here is telling so that when you whenever you have sophisticated um synthetic data generation pipeline so i need to say that is a very very difficult problem um whenever you have gans or now conditional gans or so it is very difficult because well there are mathematic constraints on uh, the gap of training uh depending on whatever you put into the simulation etc um so it just makes it very difficult, even to start. For starting, you need to have a good data set already. And that's why it's so topologically in order. So first you collect the real world data, and then at some point, so some years later, you can actually try to tackle the problem of the synthetic data generation. So here are some samples that you see for class segmentation, bounding box, and instance segmentation. And uh, here are also some videos that maybe show um, even a bit better how such yeah, the synthetic data generation at the very end looks like by the time it's generated. And more information uh, can even be seen on this GDC talk. There actually, besides that talk, a couple of other talks I want to highlight. So just check out the GDC page of NVIDIA and um, check out the autonomous, um, yeah, driving talks there. Um, yeah, so last before we end and conclude, I'd like to talk a bit about this software stack that I mentioned and this well part of this whole stack that NVIDIA is delivering. So I said uh, the base of everything is like the software um, that also means the whole sensor set, camera, radar, lighters. Um, and on the right, you also see everything that has to do with the cloud and data uh, infrastructure and installations, so TGX, et cetera. So on top of that, resides the, well, our operating system, the DriveOS for booting that platform, for doing compute, CUDA, for doing inference, TensorRT, some developer tools to make your life easier, and um, the NVIDIA ISP for image, um, image work. On top of that is like a middle layer framework for uh, the sensor abstraction so that you don't have to call the driver di directly. 
um, in low level <clears throat> in low level domain, and uh, also like I/O tools, recorder function, because well before doing the simulation uh, you need to have tools for the recording, calibration, etc. Yeah, and then on top you find all your uh, yeah. Uh, scenario models or scenario applications, let's say, um, which are then topped by the Drive AV or IX stack um, for the very uh, high level applications like NCAP, the autonomous driving itself that are requiring um, all these middle applications and IR models. All right, so um, my last words here will be about the Drive Developer Program, um, which uh, you can find on developer.nvidia.com slash drive. You, uh, by joining that developer program, you have access to different APIs, um, to forums, to discussions, uh, asking questions uh, inside these forums to our uh, APIs and SDKs. Just check them out and uh, see what it all has to offer. And then to learn more, um, the NVIDIA books are very good resource I can recommend. Also, um, the GDC automotive sessions uh, next to the drive videos. And then to stay tuned, check out Twitter, LinkedIn, um, Instagram, and um, yeah, feel free to subscribe to our NVIDIA Draft newsletter. That's from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks to Fabian, we had the positive proof that uh, living on the matrix is safer than in the real world. Uh, any <laughs> questions, please? Um, Pete Marlon, back. Uh, th thanks a lot uh, for the nice talk. Um, I'm mainly interested actually in the simulation part. And I, I think you started out with explaining that it's very um, like at the core for validating um, the models for the, let's say, for the auto autonomous driving systems. And then later you talked mainly about data generation. So I wasn't fully sure if I maybe missed uh, the step. So how do you know that you have uh, validated enough so that you can go to the top of the pyramid and do this last mile testing on the road. I mean, what, what criteria do you use for that? Yeah. Um, have you ever heard of NCAP uh, testing and NCAP safety scenarios? So there are, there are actually uh, like the Euro NCAP, it, uh, it's one of the highest safety standards that you can uh, uh, comply to, I would say is the correct term. And um, there are different norms and rule that, rules that are implemented. And besides that, you also implement against your own set of um, yeah, epsilon rules and sigma rules uh, when it comes to uh, evaluating, I don't know, IOU, for example, um, against traditional um, accuracy uh, models. So yeah, there are a bunch of rules. Uh, it would re-explode um, the terms if I would go into that like too deep right now. But particular, um, I recommend you to check out NCAP and um, also to check out the ISO rules when it comes to safety critical applications and deployments. That uh, is then particular true for production vehicles for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Or, okay. I think I, I know those, but I, I will I will check it again. It's it's for me was it not fully clear if um, I mean, these standards define scenarios indeed, but I mean, you have to have some measurements that tell you how well you have fulfilled. I mean, the, I mean, how, how successful mm -hmm. you actually were. And I'm yeah. not sure if that so is that, defined. I need to say, yeah, I need to say that really the, like the KPIs, what you're, I think that's what you're talking about per model. It really depends on a model basis because some models are really just object detection models, the more easier ones, let's say. Some other models, um, well, are segmentation-based or pixel segmentation-based. And then when it comes to this driving, planning and behavior scenarios, um, like defining, creating these scenarios is one thing where you have the some of the ground truth data already. Um, and you can test, for example, against that or even the labeling or the definition of your scenarios. Um, I can say there are, for example, a bunch of very, very difficult routes that are very well defined against, um, like to test it against. And that also is very, very different when you, for example, compare high speed driving um, on uh, standard cars against uh, trucks. 
against urban scenarios. So for each of these scenarios, there's a bunch of rules and KPIs behind that. Uh, that alone is a non-trivial task. So yes, it's not only mm, given, let's say, um, it is a lot of uh, coming from experience and um, yeah, well-known collaborations with the OEMs um, yeah, on how to define okay, these Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I have a question. So we are worried about the uh, energy consumption and I wonder if you have ever calculated the full amount of energy that is needed to do the on-car uh, compute, communications, networks, cloud-based storage compute. How does that compare to the actual mechanical moving of the car? How much mileage would you lo lose from electric vehicles percentage-wise? Is it 0.1%? Is it 30% uh, energy going uh, for actual compute co compared to mechanical? Driving. Do you know? Do you know? Oh, yeah. Good. Good question. So, that's also a very non-trivial question that I cannot answer, unfortunately, like out of the get-go, because it is very dependent on your car. For example, uh, for example, what kind of windshields or uh, mirrors or so does your car have? That is actually uh, very important because just leaving that out from a mechanic perspective mechanical against mechanical so leaving it out or not it's like a major thing but now comparing the compute which is like the horsepower kind of nowadays um non-trivial requires like a non-trivial answer so i can tell that for each car um even inside a production line for each car it's uh vastly different and we can also say so when you check out our um, systems on a chip, so our hardware that we published over the past years, the initial assumption was that these, everyone thought that, right? The initial assumption was that with these chips that we provided, I don't know, six years ago, um, a robot taxi would be capable of driving. And well, it was just proven wrong because the compute is, it's just much more compute needed nowadays and for sure it is important to make it more efficient so that your mileage is not suffering from that and in order to encompass that um on site this soc are more than just like igpu image processing accelerators and um the igpu um there are also uh, things like dla for example like deep learning accelerator which runs very low um energy or uh, PVA is another accelerator. Um, these are accelerators that nowadays an engineer needs to be able to work on. Um, so that is basically doing a split now between C++ high-performance computing, CUDA computing, and now also uh, not assembly in general, but very hardware-specific um, programming onto these devices because they are very limited in memory, for example, uh, limited in their compute. Um, and by optimizing these DNNs and basically optimizing to these uh, accelerators, you're then able to reduce the power in general. Uh, but it, coming back to a question, so it's difficult to say how much you would say. It could be. It really depends. So, at the moment, it could be even 20, 30% of energy consumption of the car or it depends. So, it, but it for example, could, okay. if you would have a rematch, <laughs> if you would have a Remark supercar, let's say, um, maybe the energy consum consumption would scale much different than if you would have, uh, I don't know, a Mercedes-Benz car. Also, it also depends, like, on your driving behavior and so, and yeah, on on the driving. roads that you're driving. So. Okay. Okay, Fabian, yeah. I, th I think we have to yeah. thank you again uh, because the schedule is tight. Thank you, Fabian. For sure. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. And we move to U.S. from University of Iowa, um, Deputy Director of Driving Safety Research Institute, Omar Ahmed. Um, Omar, are you online? Do you hear me? Hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, we hear and we see clear. Yeah, you can start sharing the screen. How's this?
Yes? Yes. You can see it. Okay, wonderful. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, be part of the data science seminar. Um, I'm, um, I'm uh, really um, just honored that you um, want to hear from us. And so we would like to share some of uh, our experiences of testing an ADS vehicle on rural roadways in Iowa. Uh, and my name is Omar Ahmad and I work at the University of Iowa Driving Safety Research Institute. Uh, formerly, this was called the National Advanced Driving Simulator, but we recently changed our name. Um, and my role at the organization is deputy director, and my role on this uh, very big project is uh, project manager. So um, the motivation uh, for us. Um, so the project that I'm describing to you was funded under um, the US DOT, the US Department of Transportation Demonstration Grant Program. And this was a very unique kind of one-time funding that became available a few years ago. Um, and the US DOT solicited uh, proposals from across the country. Um, and we at the University of Iowa were very interested in this topic, um, but we also wanted to do something that was um, necessarily not uh, maybe trying to repeat what was being done in other locations. Um, so when we look at this data from the uh, US DOT AV Automated Vehicle Test Initiative, this is a website that you can go to where they, uh, where if somebody wishes to share information with the US DOT about what kind of testing they're doing, then it appears here and then others can learn. Um, so a lot of the testing in the, in the US as it relates to automated vehicles um, is being done in more urban areas, is being done on interstates and it's being done in um, um, in warmer weather states. Um, and what we really saw was an underrepresentation of testing um, in rural areas. Um, now that's, uh, it's really important because, um, you know, while a smaller segment of the population uh, lives in rural areas, um, nearly half of all fatalities occur on rural roadways um, in the United States. Um, so, if automated vehicles are going to realize their promise of improving safety, um, then we would like to see that safety for everyone and not just folks in, in certain locations. Um, another really important component of this is uh, looking at who, who are the people that are served from these types of technologies. So in rural areas, so first of all, overall in the US, we have an aging population. Um, uh, the, 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 mean, the mean age is getting older. Um, and as people age, um, they want to remain independent and mobility is the key factor in, in being independent. Um, and the challenge with rural areas is that there's generally no, little or no public transportation in the US in, in rural locations. So as people age, um, and as we see the services like healthcare moved regionally to regional centers, it becomes a big challenge. Um, so AVs um, potentially are this great uh, technology that once it's, uh, once it's you know, deployed and once it's working well, uh, this could be a great way for people, older people, mobility impaired populations in rural areas to get from one location to another and to get from the rural locations to the urban centers that contain the services that they need. Um, and, and then a key component of our project is data. We're producing a lot of data. Uh, perhaps our data is nowhere close in size to the data that, um, that the previous presenter talked about from NVIDIA. But nevertheless, I think this is very unique data and it's publicly available uh, to be used. And I will talk more about that in my presentation. So rural areas uh, have a number of unique challenges. Um, in many ways, rural roadways are no different than urban roadways, but in some ways they are very, very different. Um, and one of the things that is, uh, is, is a very unique characteristic of rural roadways is that is the diversity of the vehicles that share the same road. These are typically two lane, two -lane roads um, and, um, and you have the posted speed limit, maybe 55 miles an hour or 60 miles an hour, but the diversity of the speeds of vehicles that share that same roadway is huge. So you have vehicles that are traveling at 55 or 60, but then you also have vehicles, uh, farm equipment, horse buggies. This is very common actually still in Iowa, 
that are traveling at um, 10 miles an hour or below. Um, stop school buses, for instance, that's another very important uh, use case. Um, and then with rural roadways, uh, the, the, surface, um, the surface type and condition is not very predictable. So you can be on a very smooth uh, and paved rural roadway, um, and then that same roadway can become, um, uh, uh, that same rural roadway can have really good lane markings or it can have very poor lane markings and that same roadway can with little or no warning become, uh, become very rough or, or even unpaved. And certain types of technologies uh, handle these types of situation okay, and certain types of technologies, especially camera-based technologies that need lane markings uh, may not work well in these types of situations. Um, so as I mentioned, um, people are getting getting older in the United States and um, and uh, older people are projected to outnumber children by the year 2035. Um, and, and we need to have mobility options for these folks. Um, so the so this is uh, the project that we're doing. It's a demonstration. And um, I will try and describe a little bit more about what that means. But it's one vehicle and it's a uh, it's a four transit. And then this vehicle was upfitted to be ADA compliant. Uh, that means that it has a wheelchair lift and um, grab bars and stuff like that for older people to be in it. Um, and then there, and then, it, and then it was uh, there were a number of sensors installed, and uh, some of these sensors directly support uh, the automation software. Um, we are using um, and uh, the automation software toolkit called Apollo Apollo version 5.0 from the company Baidu. Um, and then our technology partner in this demonstration is um, a company called Autonomous Stuff, which is a subsidiary of Hexagon. So they're the ones that, that <clears throat> outfitted the vehicle with these um, sensors. And as I mentioned, some of these sensors are there for the automation, but some of these sensors are there simply because we wanted to collect as much data as possible. So one of the sensors that we have, for instance, is a, um, is a uh, Visalia road surface uh, weather detector. Uh, that collects um, coefficient, coefficient of friction information about um, the roadway as, as we are uh, driving the vehicle. Um, here's a short video that, that shows um, the testing that's taking place. Uh, not all the roadways are gravel in Iowa, so I certainly don't mean to give anyone that impression, but this is, this is common in Iowa and this is part of our route. Um, and so in this uh, video, you're seeing the vehicle is currently under driving is driving under automation. That's the blue steering wheel. Um, it blue means that it's under automation. Gray means that it's not. There's a safety driver that's always <laughs> monitoring the vehicle, and the we you know for us uh, with the type of testing that we were doing and and driving in mixed traffic, it was really important that we have a well well trained safety driver. Um, and so not only do we have a safety driver, but we have a co-pilot. But in this situation, <clears throat> while it was driving more or less fine under automation, nevertheless, the safety driver felt like there was a situation developing when this um, when we had when we encountered this oncoming vehicle on the curve with the sun blinding us and everything, that uh, the safety driver felt that it was best to take it out of, out of automation. And so as we're as we're driving this vehicle uh, on this route. Um, and we're collecting all the data. We are we are seeing um, we're co we're collecting all kinds of data on where the vehicle is, whether uh, the, whether the vehicle is driving under automation and where it's not, where the safety driver decided that it was doing something that was potentially unsafe, and then we try to we log that, and then we try and then we have that data available so that we can potentially explore. So not uh, just us, but others can explore what were the factors that led to that disengagement and, and potentially how we can make that better in the future. Um, so we drive this uh, 47 mile out um, in Iowa. It goes through four communities. Uh, and one of the towns is uh, Iowa City, which is uh, also home of the University of Iowa. But uh, from there, we go to um, uh, a community center in a small town called Hills and, uh, and a casino in another small town called uh, Riverside and then a public library in another small town called Kelowna. And we chose this route um, not with the idea that we want uh, it to make it as uh, easy or to be able to say that, oh, look, we can automate all of the route. We picked these roadways 
reg regardless of whether we thought the vehicle would be able to handle it. We picked the roadways more for the diversity of the roadways to make sure that we had different classes of roadways, to make sure that we had different types of intersections, to make sure that we were able to expose the vehicle to as many different types of roadways and intersections and potentially conditions as possible. Uh, because we were really interested in really documenting the places uh, where there's a, a challenge and where there's difficulty and collecting data that can potentially help us explain why, uh, wh why those areas are challenges. Um, so we organized our data collection into six phases of data collection. Um, you know, we are not the experts on automation software uh, because we are, you know, we don't, we didn't write the software. Uh, we didn't develop the software, but we are I would I would like to say that we are we are really good at collecting data and running research studies. That is the and especially research studies involving automation and and higher levels of automation and looking at behavior of people in driving conditions. I think that's really the specialty that we have at the University of Iowa with our human factors research. So when we when we originally uh, wrote the proposal, I mean we didn't really have a great idea of the the status of the automation or how it would do and and how sophisticated it was. Um, so we organized the data collection into six phases, and the idea was that the automation would get better with each each phase, and that we would make it more and more challenging uh, by by automating uh, more challenging um, parts of the route. So initially, we were just using automation on highways and interstates because that's obviously the lowest hanging fruit, the easiest challenge for most automation systems. Uh, but then we quickly uh, with each successive phase, we we added different types of roadways, so like ramps, on ramps, off ramps, uh, urban locations with traffic signals, uh, unmarked roadways without without lane markings and gravel, and then we even have some V2X uh, or actually V2V, I should say, interactions. Uh, our plan was to do V2X interactions with signals at, at intersections, but unfortunately, with the with that FCC ruling change that happened, it it really caused a lot of havoc and um, the new sensors that were needed, uh, the city, uh, our city did not have those sensors. So we used a camera-based approach to look at the state of traffic signals as opposed to the V2X that we were had originally planned. And then now we're doing testing where we have automated almost uh, the entire route um, and we are parking uh, under automation as well in different types of parking spots, angled parking, um, uh, uh, straight parking. Um, so on and so forth. Um, so this is an example of the automation uh, that we had in, in phase one, uh, that was about a year and a half ago. Uh, and we had about 60, over 60% 60 of the route under automation. And then uh, the phase that we just recently got done, phase five, we al almost all the route, 98.3% uh, of the route is, is under automation. I, I really want to point out that the, that the percentage of route driven under automation is um, is one metric, and it doesn't provide the complete picture because what we're not seeing here is the number of disengagements. Um, and and while uh, the percentage of the route that's not driven under automation may be very small, the number of disengagements is quite significant still. In fact, uh, between phase one and phase five, the number of disengagements hasn't changed much. It's just that the reason for disengaging changing. So maybe some of the older reasons have been worked out and the software is better. So the safety driver feels very good and then they keep it under automation. But as we automate areas and they have more things to worry about, uh, and then there's more disengagements in the in the newer locations. So uh, we really have to look at both things together. We cannot look at just one. Um, so we have 60 complete drives uh, of the 47 mile route loop and a lot and, and we collect data on every mile, on every part of the roadway, regardless of whether we're under automation or not, that data is collected. Um, and then we also take riders. I haven't explained this yet. Uh, so we have a, a safety driver and we have a co-pilot, but we also recruit the older people that live in those towns to be riders with us. Uh, we don't really run it like a service. Uh, this is a research study after all, but we definitely recruit people that, that would potentially use a service like that. Um, and then those riders, we meet them at, at a pre-designated location, and then they, then they ride the entire 47-mile loop with us. And we're also collecting very interesting data from those drivers that I will share briefly. Um, so our, our safety team consists of a safety driver and a co-pilot. 
Um, the safety driver, again, their only role is to monitor the vehicle or drive it when it's needed. And then the co-pilot uh, has some displays with extra information about how the automation is doing. And there are cases where we see some very interesting things happening. So they are able to log, they're able to insert manual markers in the data uh, that we can go back uh, and look at later. Um, and then of course, before every drive, there's um, maintenance and safety checks that are done. Um, there is a researcher in the back of the vehicle with the two passengers because um, that researcher, again, they're not worried about the automation. They're not worried, worried about the driving or the logging, but they are uh, looking after those older folks and their needs um, as they are our passengers. And then finally, there's a remote monitor as well. Uh, when I say remote monitor, it is truly just a monitor and not control. So we can't do remote control of the vehicle. But just, again, for safety reasons, it's good to have a remote monitor. And in the unlikely event that there's a problem, that they can, they can help uh, facilitate uh, help to arrive. Um, so there's a lot of lessons that we've learned. Um, and um, I will try and share some of those with you. Um, so uh, when, we, when we do this type of testing, um, and this testing is taking place on open roadways, we're in mixed traffic. Uh, we're not on a test track. So it's just really, really, really important to have well-defined roles. And uh, for those people that are actually part of the testing, they need to have training and a lot of training. So uh, the safety drivers are our staff in this case, they are well-versed in automated vehicle technologies and they understand uh, the capabilities and the limitations of automated vehicles. Um, they don't make any assumptions about how well the system is working. Uh, but they also had training from the bus service, uh, the university bus service on driving a large vehicle. And then they had training from the technology provider on the specific capabilities of the automation for each phase that we were doing the testing in. And communication between when you have multiple entities like a university and a technology provider and maybe the state and maybe the city, it's just really, really important to have communication, constant communication between all those entities. And in fact, when we, before we started testing in, in these rural areas, we went to each city, we spoke to the city council, we went to the city fairs and we brought our vehicle to, you know, so that the public could see it, so that they weren't like, uh, so that they could see what was going on. And we tried to be very transparent about how we were gonna do this testing and how safety was gonna be uh, extremely important. But nevertheless, it is an automated vehicle. And, the, and our position is that the testing needs to be done in a very responsible uh, and open way so that we can all learn from it. Um, um, automation software, it, you know, th there's different types of automation software and we were just looking at one. And, um, and, but, you know, in general, the software is designed to be very conservative. It exhibits conservative behavior everywhere it goes. So the default behavior generally is to slow down, stop. Uh, and then when it's starting from a stop, um, position, especially let's say at a four-way stop sign, it is very slow to begin to get going. It usually waits and then it, it starts moving and then it pauses again and then it goes. But that can be infuriating. It can, it can anger the human drivers that are in that area that expect you to move faster and go faster. Um, and so it's just, it's really important um, that you understand that these are, that, that this is the automation uh, uh, that this is, uh, again, a limitation or feature, if you want to say it that way, of automation software. And the safety and the testing has to be done with that in mind, that if you come up upon a very, very busy intersection and there's lots of people waiting, maybe that is a good reason or a good place to disengage automation for a little bit to get through that intersection because people are going to get very upset otherwise. Um, again, uh, the the software, the automation software, it's it's programmed uh, by very smart people, but nevertheless, it's programmed the idea of a global behavior, uh, how it drives uh, itself in the lane on a roadway, in a global way, on all roadways. And generally, there isn't a lot of uh, like special code that is that is initiated when you're on one type of a roadway versus another. Uh, and 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 I think that that uh, that may certainly is seems to be the way that Apollo works. Uh, but maybe it's changing for other software. But one specific example that I'll give you is how you drive a gravel roadway. So in a, so we have an HD map and, uh, and the vehicle knows where its lane is on the gravel roadway. Uh, and it drives perfectly in the center of its, of its lane. 
but that is not how you drive a gravel road. A gravel road is generally, you don't have many vehicles on it. And so you generally drive the vehicle in the, you should be driving in the center of the, of the road, uh, straddling both lanes. And then as an oncoming vehicle approaches, you give way, you both move to the edge. And the reason why you do it that way is because the edge of the gravel roadway is, is generally uh, very loose. Uh, and especially when there's bad weather or wet weather or snowy weather, that's the part that's really muddy. And it can be very easy to get your wheel basically caught in the mud and, and be steered off the roadway. And so uh, the vehicle, uh, you know, when we when we turned it on on the gravel roadway, it wanted to drive it like in this perfect manner, which was, in, in our opinion, perfect, the exact wrong way to drive um, the thing. So we had to make some adjustments uh, to the HD map and, and uh, we, we weren't able to really change the programming of the automation. We really had to just make some adjustments to the HD map to, to facilitate the driving of gravel roadways. Uh, weather is another important consideration. Um, uh, so uh, in, in this example, um, you know, we use LIDAR uh, just like a lot of people. And when ice forms on the LIDAR, uh, especially, uh, you know, as you're doing a drive, it may be, it may be okay and then it snows or it's icy and then ice forms on the, on the LiDAR system. Uh, if the LiDAR system essentially is blind, uh, but uh, the automation software has no idea uh, that, the, that the LiDAR is blind. From the automation software's perspective, it's, it, since there's no objects that are showing up, it means it's all clear. Whereas in fact, there may be objects there, it's just that the LiDAR can't see them because the LiDAR is covered by ice. Um, and so a lot of automation systems, at least our one, I would say, the, the, there's not a lot of holistic systems integration that's being done yet. One part doesn't necessarily know the limitations of another part and doesn't know uh, that there's a limitation or a problem. And it will just assume uh, like everything is okay. And that can be very dangerous. Um, and it goes back to, again, having well-trained drivers. Uh, intersections, um, we, we use a camera-based approach. Uh, for detecting uh, the signal heads. Um, this approach works really well, but it can also have a lot of problems. So for instance, if the geometry of the intersection is such that you approach the signal head at an angle, it can be very easy for your vehicle to pick up the wrong signal head in another lane. And so suddenly it may think it's green when it's really red for your lane. Uh, these are, there's lots of problems that we've seen like this. Sometimes if if there's a tall vehicle in front of you, which is, again, semi-trucks are very common in Iowa. If you're behind a tall vehicle and you approach the intersection, your vehicle won't even see the, the signal head because it's being occluded by the tall vehicle. Um, so these are certainly big challenges. Um, and then again, I cannot overstate the importance of safety driver training. And that, you know, I know that, that the goal is to have, is to be able to reduce the, the need for trained drivers. And a lot of municipalities that operate large busing systems, they look at AV's technologies and they say, oh my goodness, you know, this is a great way for us to have fewer drivers. And um, because it's really hard to train drivers, it's really hard to retain drivers. But given where the state of the technology is right now, actually it's, we have, we have quite the opposite challenge. Right now, not only do we need drivers, but we need super drivers that are not only great bus drivers, but also understand AV systems. Uh, because the technology is simply not there uh, to, to have uh, kind of this uh, no driver, first of all, or a driver that doesn't know what the limitations of the, uh, of the AV are. The only situation where I see this working is if you have a geofenced area, perhaps, um, where it's only like, certain type of vehicle, and maybe all of them are under automation, then I, because I think the biggest challenge remains for automated vehicles is to really stand the intention of, uh, of human driven vehicles. And so finally, we have a data portal, and I have a QR code up here, you can go to our data portal, you can, you can, uh, you can get access to the portal. And we present summary statistics on every drive that we're doing. Uh, but there's also ways for you to uh, request access. Um, and, and play with the data. Um, and and th that requires that you register, uh, but a lot of capability there. And, and, and then there's a lot of limitations also, but we're working on making the data portal more useful. So uh, given that this is a data science webinar, I mean, I would encourage you all to please take a look and give us your feedback. Um, and um, we have 
a lot of interesting YouTube videos just like you guys. Um, um, and we would encourage you to go to YouTube and check out our videos. We've tried to be as transparent as possible. Um, and we have a great team of people that are working on this project. Um, and I'm just one of those people. Um, but uh, it's, uh, it's a big collaboration between the US DOT, the Iowa DOT, Hexagon, and Manly Communications in the University of Iowa. And I thank you for your time. And that's the website of the project. And you can always get more information there. Thank you, Omar. It looks like Estonia. Yes, it does. Very familiar landscapes and roads. OK, questions? Thank you for the talk. Uh, I actually have a question from the previous presentation, but I think it's on point with regard to your uh, presentation too concerning safety. Uh, first, I have a couple of inquiries. So how many miles is required on average to get from simulation to real world? So getting the level of fidelity to a, to a certain threshold that would be ready to go to the real world experiment? Uh, I, I don't really have the answer to that question, but I, I think that it would, it there, when we, when we make updates to the map, um, and generally that's how we've tried to handle improving the capability of the vehicle. When we make updates to the map, there are, there are a lot of simulations that are done to, to try and, uh, and predict potential problems that are going to, that are going to occur as a result of even the simplest change. Like let's say you have um, a road that has a speed limit of 55, but there's a curve and there's no physical speed limit sign, uh, but you decide to insert a virtual speed limit sign to kind of help the vehicle be a little bit more smoother. Um, the, the moment that even one change like that is done, you have to do a lot of testing uh, in simulation before you can take that vehicle out on the roadway. Uh, and, but a lot, but mo all the simulation testing was done by our technology partners, Manly Communication and, and autonomous stuff. So I don't really have uh, a good answer for you on how many miles. Okay, Jakob wants to take the mic. I ask my question very quickly. So my question is actually that, yes. uh, so it's probably thousands of miles, uh, but uh, Easy. In reality, when we give it driving license to a person, it's about 5,000, 6,000 miles maybe, uh, and then we give a, a license to them. So I'm wondering like... It's not even that in Iowa. It's less. Okay, yes. even less. So yeah. my question is, yeah. are we getting the matter about safety wrong? So how can we uh, get to that level so that we can trust the system or build a system that would be similar in that aspect? After all, we're building the AIs that are, uh, so to say, uh, mimic the human intelligence. So I would appreciate your comment on that. <laughs> ah, that's a challenging question. Um, I think that, um, oof, I, you, you know, the, the, our experiences is that we, we like to see these technologies as support for the driver. And I don't see any evidence that suggests that 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 automated vehicles or or ADS vehicles are ready to to take charge of driving um, like like you can put in the hands of a human. Uh, will it be safer statistically? Uh, potentially, yes, because I think that the number of fatalities per mile driven will be will be safer, even perhaps under the automation systems that are out there now. But the but the challenge is that is that uh, automation systems, I mean, they're really good at, at overcoming the shortcomings of humans, which is we are terrible at monitoring things and paying attention over long periods, doing the same thing over and over. We're terrible at that. But we're really good, in my opinion, at handling situations that we've never seen before. And by and large, the, 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 the kind of the gut thing that we do generally ends up being okay. And that's where automation is terrible. It's terrible at those types of situations. So I, I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like for the moment, I haven't seen any evidence that suggests that, that automation is going uh, is to handle that. Now, the way that it can be done is when you, when you, geo, when you work with geofenced areas. That's, to me, as long as they have to interact with human-driven human vehicles, with humans of all intelligent levels and all level of training, I think it's going to be a big challenge. 
Amen. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's going to be a challenge. Thank you, Omar, uh, very much. And uh, another round of applause. Thank you. And we are now moving uh, back to Tartu, our own Tambet Matizen, who is, uh, what is your official position? Lead engineer at our autonomous driving lab, please. Thank you. Can I be heard? Yes, all good. So welcome everyone. Uh, uh, I'm representing the Autonomous Driving Lab. Uh, and so uh, let's start with a few words about the, the lab. Uh, the lab was founded in 2019 together with the company Bolt. You probably know them. And uh, in 2020 January, we got our uh, car. And in 2020 September, we were able to do uh, like a street driving demo. Uh, autonomous driving on the, in the city center of Tartu. And one of our latest achievements was uh, last year, uh, in April, uh, we participated in uh, the uh, Tartu City uh, on-demand transportation project, where we gave uh, autonomous rides, uh, like uh, almost 30 people uh, between the city center of Tartu and uh, Warbus and Tixoya area. And the kind of goals our lab has in the long term are first to evaluate the robot taxi technology when the Bolt needs to take action on this, uh, then do a world-class research in self-driving technologies, and to prepare the future workforce for all the Estonian self-driving companies. But today I would like to focus on one particular thing about our lab. So the, the way our lab is set up is that we have an engineering team, like roughly five people, and uh, researchers or, and PhD students and postdocs uh, loosely related to our lab, and there's maybe 20 of those. And the way how we imagined uh, this setup working out is that we have uh, engineers who create some kind of base platform and those researchers do some experiments using that base platform and write papers and so on. And as a result of that research, uh, there will be some improvements to the base platform and the engineering team takes those improvements or new algorithms, new ideas, integrates those into the base platform and in a, over time uh, it gets better, like this loop uh, does cycles and it gets better and better. In practice, it hasn't really worked out. And uh, one of the reasons is that uh, the software we were using on the car uh, called AutoWare, it's open source software written in C++. And like the researchers were not really comfortable uh, implementing their ideas uh, in C++. Also, uh, a lot of state-of-the-art research in autonomous driving happens, uh, the uses of machine learning. And it's really cumbersome for the engineers to integrate the machine learning solutions into C++ code base. So uh, this previous software platform that we were using um, was really preventing us from running this loop uh, between the engineers and researchers. So today I would like to announce like a solution for this. So we came up uh, with a, a new software. Uh, it's called AutoWare Mini. And uh, it's written in Python. It's, it has the minimal numbers of dependencies. It has low resource requirements. It's fast. Uh, and it's written in Python. And uh, it uses ROS1. Um, and uh, all of those things are. Uh, like chosen with um, one or one or two goals in mind. First, to make it easier for the students to pick it up and start experimenting with it. And secondly, make it easier for the researchers to uh, pick it up and uh, start experimenting with it. And, uh, and one of the important features, uh, why we based this uh, software on Python, is that uh, Python is the go-to language for anything machine learning. Uh, so if you do machine learning, then you, you are comfortable with Python. 
And some people uh, might ask that, uh, oh, uh, okay, uh, we will get uh, back to that, uh, to the Python part, but uh, so what this AutoWare Mini actually does, uh, how does it work? Uh, so I will give you a quick run, uh, run through uh, of the architecture uh, of the software. So the main, uh, the key uh, module that we start, where we start from is localization or positioning of the car. Uh, there are multiple ways how you can do it. Uh, we mainly use the GPS positioning or in more general uh, case, if we use uh, multiple satellite systems, then it's the GNSS, but you could also use LiDAR or uh, Visual SLAM or anything like that. So what localization gives you is the current position, where you are and your current speed. Then you feed that into a global planner. Global planner uh, plans the path from your current location to the destination. It's kind of similar like uh, Google Maps uh, does it, but uh, the map that we are using for planning is more precise. It's a lane level map, uh, not a uh, road level map that we, uh, normal Google Maps uses. So the result of a global planner is a global path. We call it global path. In parallel, there is a obstacle detection uh, module that takes the information from the LiDAR, radar, or cameras. We mainly rely on LiDAR right now and uh, produces detected objects. Also, what is uh, running in parallel is the traffic light detection. So there are, again, multiple ways how, how to detect traffic lights. Uh, currently, uh, what we have implemented is API-based uh, uh, traffic light detection. We have a direct connection with a city traffic light control system, and we get uh, information which traffic light has which color on. Uh, and we, thanks to MAP, uh, we can associate the traffic lights with the stop lines, and we know the status of each stop line. This all feeds into the local planner uh, that uh, decides uh, how to avoid those obstacles or uh, how to, when the, it needs to stop for the stop line. And uh, all this information is uh, incorporated into so-called local path. Uh, it goes like 100 meters from the current position. In our current implementation, the local path is basically the same as the global path. It only changes the speed profile at each time step. And finally, uh, the follower takes in the global path and just tries to follow it. The speed profile, the turns, the trajectory, as well as possible, including switching on the turning signals if necessary. And my point is that it might seem like a lot of things and a lot of arrows and a lot of boxes, but in the end, it's a six uh, modules. Uh, you can distill down the autonomy software into six uh, like conceptual modules. And the uh, current implementation in Python, there is a lot more, uh, there is a lot more code, but the key modules that make up the the, the autonomy software, it's less than 2,000 lines of code. Less than 2,000 lines of code, that means that you can analyze and focus on each line individually and understand if it does what it does and if it's correct. Uh, the total number of lines is something like 5,000, but the, the less than 2,000 is the critical path that runs in a, in a tight loop. A uh, little bit step back uh, to the choice of Python. Like uh, some people might uh, ask, like, isn't Python too slow for a time critical software like uh, autonomy software? And uh, yes and no. Uh, I want to outline, outline uh, highlight some uh, ways how you can make Python much faster. One thing is Python has ready-made algorithms uh, available for you. For example, what we need to do very often is to look the closest point to a given point. Uh, X, Y coordinates, what is the closest point to it? Uh, if you use spatial indexing, which is readily available for you in Python, you can do it in log n uh, time. Uh, if you do it naively in uh, C++, then it's uh, just n, uh, O n time. So, 
uh, things like that, or uh, vectorized computation. When you uh, multiply some tensor with a matrix, if you do it with NumPy, uh, then and you use some Intel extensions, then it automatically uses maybe some uh, special instructions on the uh, on the CPU. When you do it naively in C++, you you write four loops. And uh, if you use the Python as a glue code, as you it, as it is supposed to be used, then you offload all the computation to the uh, uh, external libraries, which are maybe written in C or C++, they are fast. And uh, just a minor comment here is that if you do that, uh, then uh, some people here might know that uh, Python has a problem with parallelization. You cannot run really two Python threads in parallel, but if you offload computation to external libraries, then this uh, global interpreter lock is returned or released uh, at the moment when it's offloaded to external library and acquired again when uh, the control goes back to the Python. So if you use more uh, external libraries, then uh, you are not so much um, uh, limited by the global interpreter lock. And also you can, uh, as a last resort, you can compile your uh, Python code to C or machine code using uh, Cyton or uh, Numba. So, uh, just uh, to make sure that uh, people wouldn't remember this uh, meme from this slide, uh, no, it's not true. Anyway, uh, I would like to show a couple of videos uh, of the software. Uh, there are four ways for running it. The planner testing, uh, perception testing, simulation testing, and real-world testing. I don't show the real-world testing today. Uh, I will show it uh, on some other time, but the first three I will show you. The first example is uh, planner testing. The planner is the most crucial component of the uh, autonomy software. And what you see here, the, the first thing you see is the vehicle itself. It's uh, in this simple planner simulation denoted as a bicycle with the two wheels. Because the bicycle with the two wheels is the, the most uh, realistic, uh, how you get the realistic, realistic trajectories uh, or model realistic trajectories for a car. And you see that it's positioned in front of Delta on the map uh, that we have created for the uh, city center of Tartu. And now you position the car and you give it the destination. This blue line is the global path uh, that, that I talked about previously. It goes from the current position to the destination. And additionally, this green line is the local path that extends 100 meters from the current point on. And at each uh, waypoint of the local path, there is a speed, a desired speed, at which speed you have to be in that uh, point. And now I switch to a different view from uh, behind of the vehicle, and I put the artificial uh, obstacle on the road. So you see like a red wall. Uh, that red wall uh, denotes the place where the vehicle should stop. And the planner module is really Planning simulation is really convenient to place uh, fictional obstacles on the road, pick them up uh, with a second click, and, uh, and it's, it needs a very low resources. Probably it will run on uh, student laptops with no problem at all. Something you can do, you can also reposition the vehicle, uh, just move it to a different place, and it just continues driving from there. So it's quite robust and uh, easy to work with. Uh, second thing I would like to show is the perception testing. So to test the perception algorithms, you would want to run them against the real uh, sensor raw data. And here we see uh, uh, LiDAR-based detection run against the sensor data. We are replaying the sensor data. And those boxes around there, these are the detections from a neural network that analyze the LiDAR data. And this neural network we trained in-house uh, on all of the public data available uh, for the LiDAR networks. It still produces occasional false positives, but I, I, I think I'm quite happy with the pedestrian detection that it seems to detect the pedestrians reasonably well. And uh, yes, uh, it's really important to, to validate those perception algorithms. And here you can also see the pre prediction functionality. What is the future path of uh, those vehicles? 
this is again something that needs a little bit more tuning right now, but uh, uh, the beginning, beginnings are there already. Uh, another example of uh, perception testing where we use a different detector. Uh, uh, here you see the cluster-based detector. It basically takes all the LiDAR points. Uh, I think uh, it shows the LiDAR points here. These are the LiDAR points that you can see, and it uh, filters out those points which are crown points, and basically everything that sticks up from the ground is an obstacle. And uh, what is good about this kind of detector is that it's not dependent on uh, what was your training data for the neural network. Like TDR training data include a baby stroller. TDR training data include a, a scooter. Uh, this clustering approach uh, recognizes anything that sticks out from the ground uh, and therefore uh, is more general. And also it runs on CPU. Again, uh, this can be run on a student laptop. Okay. And finally, uh, I would like to show um, like uh, the most full-featured simulation that we have. We have built a complete uh, digital twin of the Tartu city center, uh, this lab uh, that we have covered with the map. And we have built uh, this digital twin in the Carla simulation. You see the 3D world uh, on the right. And again, uh, you can uh, set the destination and, uh, and drive around in this 3D simulation. And uh, the simulation includes our car uh, with all the sensors. And as you can see, there is a yellow line that uh, represents the point uh, from which the obstacle uh, starts for us. And uh, up there, you can see the, the numbers. Uh, the leftmost is the current speed of the vehicle, then the middle one is the uh, distance to the uh, nearest obstacle, and the right one is the uh, obstacle speed. And here you see that uh, from the view from behind, you see that uh, the speeds on the waypoints uh, changed right away when the car went away from us. And uh, here the car was stopping for the stop line. Uh, the stop line is red because the uh, traffic light associated with the stop line is red. Uh, here the car cut in again, and uh, so our car needed to do a little bit braking. Uh, but yeah, uh, in our software we are basically considering the stop line that is red and the obstacle. The same code considers the same cases, the, those two cases. Like uh, the, the red stop line for us is like a wall, uh, and it's just considered an obstacle. And a uh, really final uh, example is that you can also do the same kind of testing in Carla by switching on. In the previous example, uh, we used the crown truth obstacles provided by the Carla uh, simulation. But here we are using the LiDAR simulation and clustering detector. So here the Carla simulation simulates the LiDAR and, uh, and we should see a vehicle coming from behind and uh, when we give the car a destination, it starts following the, the passing vehicle the same way how previously. So when it uh, intersects with our local path, we, we will detect it and start following it. Anyway, uh, so uh, we are open sourcing this uh, software today for everybody to use, and uh, we, su we see potential use beyond teaching and research. Uh, for example, uh, companies Berkman or Traffest could be validating the integration with the infrastructure sensors with it. Or light code photonics could be testing custom sensors uh, in the car simulation. Or modern mobility could be validating integration with uh, mobility as a service solutions. Or Clevon or Elmorain could could it be could use it as a stepping stone from going from teleoperation to 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 autonomy. And for you, you can just go to GitHub.com, UTADL, uh, Autover Mini and there are instructions for you uh, how to download, 
how to run it, uh, the planner simulation, the back uh, based uh, simulation, and, uh, and also the Carla simulation. And uh, we're also planning to have uh, two workshops uh, for uh, internal uh, researchers or PhD students who are interested, or also for the um, uh, uh, external companies if they are interested. So one is on 19th of May and the other one is 26th of May. Uh, we can send these links after the seminar and uh, you can uh, register and, uh, and learn a little bit more how it works and how to run it. And that's basically all from me. Uh, this is the team who has been uh, hard at work to, to create this uh, software for you. Thanks. Thank you. There is a company, Ivy, who yes. uses exactly the same sensors for different purposes. Do you have any information exchange? Do I have what? No, do you make any cooperation or something? Uh, we have used uh, uh, their mapping uh, services previously. Uh, so the 3D point cloud that is also downloadable from our website. This was created by the Ivy. Thank you. Uh, a quick question. Uh, how many pizzas do I need to uh, adapt this um, uh, system uh, for driving in the, on, the, on the gravel roads uh, in Iowa? <laughs> That's a very good question. Uh, actually, this is something we, we have been thinking of. Uh, and because the University of Iowa has uh, the vehicle provided by the same provider, autonomous stuff, then the integration wouldn't be that complicated. The sensor locations are a little bit different, but uh, even the sensor set is quite similar. So uh, this is one of our dreams that uh, one day we would like to go I in to Iowa and test out the software on their vehicle. Okay, no matter how strong, uh, well, how hard I try to keep the time, but uh, still we went a little bit over time. But that's uh, okay. Behind the doors, we will have catering, wine, networking, please. Yes, and we will see you in the next data science seminars. We have your emails. We will bombard you with the uh, announcements. Thank you. Thank you.